So it's probably 6.30 on somebody's clock somewhere. So I'm gonna start um, with my script as a preliminary matter. This is, uh, I am the chair of the Arlington School Committee. Um, this open meeting of the committee is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12, 2020 due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the virus, we have been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of the open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. The order, which you can find posted with agenda materials for this meeting, allows public bodies to meet entirely remotely so long as reasonable public access is afforded so that the public can follow along with the deliberations of the meeting. Ensuring public access does not ensure public participation and such, unless such participation is required by law, this meeting will feature public comment. For this meeting, the Arlington School Committee is convening by Zoom as posted on the town's website identifying how they may join. Please note that the meeting is being recorded and some attendees are participating via video conference. Accordingly, please be aware that others may be able to see you. Take care not to screen share your computer. Anything you broadcast may be captured by the meeting. All of the materials for this meeting, except any executive session materials, are available on the Novus Agenda dashboard, and we recommend the members and the public follow the agenda as posted on Novus, unless I know otherwise. Um, I will introduce each agenda, uh, each speaker on the agenda. After they conclude, I will go down the list of members, inviting each by name to provide any comment, question, or motions. Please hold until your name is called. Please remember to mute your phone or computer when you are not speaking. Please remember to speak clearly and in a way that helps generate accurate minutes. For any response, please wait until I yield the floor to you and state your name before speaking. If members wish to engage in colloquy with other members, please do so through the chair, taking care to identify yourself. Um, each vote taken in this meeting will be conducted by a roll call vote. So um, I wanna make sure that we can hear everybody. Um, so I'm gonna do attendance. Um, I'm going to do the members and staff and then um, Dr. Bodhi, I'll need some support on um, the other folks who are here to make sure that I call on them, but I'll do the ones that I know I can do first. Um, so Ms. Exton? Here. Uh, Mr. Cardin? Yes, thank you. Uh, Dr. Allison Ampey? Here. Mr. Thielman? Yes, here. Mr. Schuchman? Good evening. Mr. Hainer? Yes. Okay, and I'm um, Jane Morgan. Um, Dr. Bodhi? Uh, present. Dr. McNeil? Here. Uh, Mr. Spiegel? Here. Mr. Mason? Here. Ms. Elmer? Here. Ms. Keys? Here. All right, this is where it gets dicey because now we got a couple pages. All right. All right. So then I also see um, Mr. Meringer. Here. Uh, Madame Pierre Maxwell. Present. Uh, Ms. Parrots, I think. No, maybe not. Yep. I just don't hear her yet. All right. And Dr. Bodhi, who and, else? And you also, I see um, Ms., um, uh, is, is it Dr. Franchi or Ms. Franchi? Right. It's, it's Dr. Frankie. Okay, Dr. Frankie. Frank, Frankie. Frankie. Um, I see us here and. Also, my pronunciation from the dental work. Um, uh, Cindy Shield, uh, Cindy Sheridan, Corinne yeah. is here, who is our, has multiple um, titles in the district, but one is has to do with all of our safety protocols. And I also see Ms. Carustis. Yes. Yep. And, and Ms. Ms. Uh, Liner is here. I'm not sure. I don't see her yet. No, but Ms. Carusas is here. And Ms. Carusas okay. is the assistant principal at Dallin, and as well as one of our two elementary coordinators for the remote academy. Perfect. Okay, so I think we've got everybody. So the first um, item on the agenda is public comment. And we had one person sign up for public comment and she is here, which is great. So. Um, this is just a reminder that the committee, we, as a matter of policy, we don't respond to public comment. Um, so, all right, uh, uh, Dr. Deb Savage. Hi, um, thank you for allowing me to speak. I'll be as, as quick as I can. Um, I'm the founder of the Arlington Special Education Alliance. We're a networking and advocacy group for Arlington parents 
whose children have special educational needs. Um, many of our members are very grateful for the extraordinary efforts being made by the district to deal with the COVID situation. Um, they've been listening very closely to district conversations since school closed last spring. They understand the complexity of the challenges at hand. Um, and they feel that they've been fairly patient as APS works to resolve these challenges. And they are willing to make hard choices in terms of the educational options uh, available to their children. Um, but there are a couple of ongoing issues related to special education that many parents are really angry about right now. And I would like to summarize for you here. I know some of you have received letters from individual parents. I have copies of some of those myself. Um, one category is the last minute changes in class and teacher assignments that were made this past weekend for special education students who are in the remote academy. Um, the class teacher assignments for most students were given out last week. The kids had a chance to do meet and greets and get to know their teachers and some of their classmates. And then a lot of special education parents, as you know already, got emails or phone calls this weekend, some of them on Sunday, the day before school started, stating that their child's class and teacher summit was going to be changed. And sometimes it was a change in school. <laughs> um, no real explanation was given as to why. There was no mechanism provided for obtaining an explanation on why. And parents resorted to calling frontline teachers or sometimes administrators, whoever they could get on the phone um, to try and figure out what was going on, why this was happening. Um, a lot of special ed education children have trouble with transitions and change, even in the best of times. Um, they, last minute changes of this kind, um, make it very difficult for them, for some of them to function social, social their social emotional health is, is an issue here. It makes it harder for them to learn. The anxiety goes up. When anxiety goes up, executive function skills go down. Um, it, it's very, very difficult. And so a, a lot of parents were very, very angry about the last minute notice, the lack of explanation, and the lack of a mechanism for actually talking to someone about what was going on. Um, in addition, several parents who did reach someone in person in the district, these are high level administrators, were told you can keep your child in the originally scheduled class if you are willing to waive your child's special education services. Now, considering the fact that these kids are struggling already and that APS was unable to deliver a lot of special education services, mandated ones last spring, that was a rather astonishing suggestion. That's one category. A second category is for special education students who have chosen to attend school in person four days a week. There's been a lack of information or a lot of contradictory information on what the educational experience will be like on days three and four. Um, oh, Dr. Savage, I just want to, so we do three minutes for public participation. So you just hit three minutes. Can you wrap up in like a minute? I will wrap up as quickly as I can. I, I'm hoping for a little leeway because I'm trying to represent a, a, a lot of parent comments here. I understand. We um, just have, okay. we have a policy about I, I will do my best. Um, APS mentioned early that a lot of students, special ed students who came in 40 days a week might just be repeating on days three and four what they got on days one and two. Other parents had agreements. No, your child actually needs some help with asynchronous work and then APS has reneged on some of those agreements and some parents just can't get a straight answer. A public evidence of some of the last minute planning for special education students was in evidence today at Gibbs parents who had desperately tried to get a schedule for their child from anyone and everyone they could think of and never got an answer showed up at Gibbs, not even having any idea which door they were supposed to go in. After the general education and the BB kids had gone into the building, about 10 tiny children and their parents were left standing on the lawn. One child started to cry. Ms. Um, the principal came out and very kindly took them all in and said, we'll figure out where you are supposed to be. But the parent writes, please know that the message sends that the highest needs kids in the school are left on the lawn with no plan, a literal and figurative afterthought. So we're requesting 
a strong response on the part of the school committee to these issues, and we're also requesting the expedited scheduling of a separate Zoom meeting to discuss special education issues in more detail in the near future. And thank you very much for allowing me to speak. Thank you. Um, okay, so the next item on the agenda is the, um, what is it actually listed as? The discussion and vote on an MOA with the Arlington Education Association. So tonight we have before us an MOA, a memorandum of agreement between the Arlington School Committee and the Arlington Education Association regarding the reopening of schools for the 2020-2021 school year. This MOA represents many, many hours of negotiations between the AEA and the district. Um, so before we start, I just want to express my gratitude to um, the AEA, AEA President Ms. Keyes, who is here with us tonight, her, uh, her team, um, as well as those um, who participated on the school committee and part of the district, Mr. Cardin, Mr. Hainer, Dr. Bodie, Dr. McNeil, Mr. Spiegel, Mr. Mason, Ms. Peretz, Mr. Meringer, Madame Pierre Maxwell, probably others who I have omitted. Um, so, but thank you for bringing us this agreement tonight for um, our discussion um, and um, ultimately vote. So um, I guess I need a motion from somebody that's not me. So move. So, uh, uh, <laughs> I, 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 Madam Chair? Yes, sir. Yes, Mr. Schlickman. I'd like to move approval of the MOA and authorize the chair to sign it on the committee's behalf. Second. Any discussion? Thank you. Um, so yes, thank you for uh, introducing it. Um, but I, I also would like to thank uh, the AEA for these difficult negotiations. It's been a, a very difficult period. There's been a lot of emotions on every side, but they came to the table prepared to discuss the issues and to get to an agreement, um, which we did reach before we opened the doors of school um, uh, on Monday. So uh, everybody worked very hard to see each other decide and um, come to some sort of agreement on these issues. Um, certainly going forward, you know, we're, we're very fortunate to have a good working relationship with the AEA. Um, going forward, I think, you know, as, as the year rolls out, um, we, you know, we'll, we have our teachers back in the building and hopefully we'll be spending more time uh, working with them to uh, fine tune everything that's happening. Uh, there's still a lot of moving parts, still a lot of scheduling issues, still a lot of things uh, to be determined, but fortunately we have the agreement as the framework to move forward. So I also wanna thank the administrative, administrative team for um, coming up with creative solutions and also for leading, leading uh, us in this. Thank you. Anybody else? Okay. Um, so, on the motion by Mr. Schuchman, seconded by Dr. Elson Impey, on the approval of the um, MOA with the AEA, <laughs> it's a lot of acronyms, um, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schuchman. Yes. Mr. Hainer. Yes. And I am also yes. All right, um, and okay, so next um, is the school opening update from um, Dr. Bodie and Dr. McNeil. Um, so I'm not sure who wants to start. Um, I will start. Uh, let me just give you an overview, and there's a number of people here uh, this evening to uh, delve in a little bit more in terms of the experience of this week. Um, I, I want to put this in context. It, the, the, school, the schools opened beautifully this week. Um, there were a lot of challenges to overcome in order for that to be to happen. Uh, 
And I want to thank all of our teachers, administrators for working the long hours that it took to get to this point. Sort of like opening day, and it was for sure. Um, it's not to say there were not bumps and there's not going to be things that we still need to continue to work out. There are. The thing that people need to remember is that we're creating two entirely new programs in our district. One is a remote academy, which we've never done before, that involves about a third of all of our students in the district. Uh, those are listening, I'm sorry, I just had some dental work. I'm, I'm, I have a little bit of a talking through cotton a little bit. But um, the, the, we also have a hybrid program, which is an entirely different schedule than we have had in the past. And uh, it involves a combination of in-person, asynchronous, uh, and, and as, well as, as well as synchronous remote instruction as well. So it's been a lot to, to do, and, and the feedback we get only is going to help us um, improve upon what we do over the next uh, couple of weeks. And, uh, but I do say that I, I had put out a Google Doc for everybody to fill in, and, and by and large, it was a couple of little glitches, but most of it was very positive. I've had uh, positive emails from parents, um, as I know our principals have as well. So um, I, we have a couple of our principals here right now, and maybe they would like to just make a comment. I know Mr. Marringer is here. Um, uh, and Mr. Armadi, and I think that uh, Ms. Parrott as well, as well as uh, uh, Madame Pierre Maxwell. So if you would just like to add a couple of comments, because I think um, coming from your experience, it sort of helps give the community the picture of how uh, the week went so far. Um, good evening, everyone. I would like to maybe share a little bit about how this week went so far with the school committee members, since I know that uh, there was a direct reference to this morning and what had occurred. Um, the staff and I had two beautiful first day on Monday and Tuesday, the children coming very excited to be in school. And I think all the adults are also really happy to receive the children. Uh, there were no incident on the first day. Uh, no children were sent to the nurse. The children did extremely well the first day. Uh, the second, uh, we had the remote learning. And today was our first day with the BB children coming in the BB portion of the hybrid program. And so principal, Sa Assistant Principal Salvatore and I are outside in the morning welcoming the parents and the children. And so are all the teachers from the classroom who have um, designated spot for all the children to enter the building according to their advisory where they stand about 10 to 12 feet apart uh, to come into the building. So this morning as I've done and as Ms. Salvatore has done for the last uh, three days, we once we give the signal for everybody to enter because our children are all around the building. I don't know the people who are familiar to what the building look like. There's a side where we have our tent that's somewhat between Foster and Tufts. So we walk around the building to make sure that all the teachers receive the timely signal to go in. So when I was making my final round to make sure that all the classroom have entered, all the buses, um, we're all set. I walk onto where we had about six children who were outside with one of our special educator liaison. Uh, our school social worker was still outside. Uh, Mrs. Greiner was visiting Gibbs today working at the school. She was outside talking to the parents. And Mr. Ron Colosi, who's one of our school counselors, was outside. And so I walk and see there was a little girl. She looked upset because she didn't remember her teacher's uh, name and she didn't remember which LC she was in. I 
pushed her and I said, it's okay. All you need to know today is your name and I will help you find your LC. So I escorted her and there were two other children. I said, okay, anyone who's not sure who's their LC or who's their advisory teacher, come with me and we'll figure it out. So we entered the building with Mrs. Van Goven, myself, Mr. Colosi. So we were, we had about three to four staff. Mrs. Griner stayed outside in conversation with two of our parents who I pushed her and I entered the school with the rest of the children. So in a scale of representing that uh, we weren't ready for the children or we didn't know which door the children were coming in. The doors has been designated prior to the start of school. Uh, the teachers are not confused. It's, it's normal, this was the second day and we had a few children who arrived just after the bulk of the children went inside in the company of their teachers and therefore they weren't able to quickly locate where they should have been but we did have adults outside to welcome the children in and the rest of the day went in just similar to what we had on the first two AA days so now in relation to the our children who are invited to come for the four days because they are part of our high need groups. Uh, some of the children were in the uh, media center, which is our library, so we can really organize the schedule to make it work. We did share with our parents that, yes, the plan is still the same, that some children may need a second dose of the same lesson. The special ed uh, liaison in coordination with their classroom teachers will be making that decision and some children will be pulled out to access their asynchronous lesson or be able to be part of their synchronous lesson during the hybrid time in the building. So as of this afternoon, every special educator liaison have been assigned a room where they will be pulling out the children and will be in collaboration with the classroom teachers to make that work. It's, it's a process we have explained to everyone We've never done it this way before. So it does take a minute to figure it out. But in regard to whether or not we have people prepared to support the children, we do have people to prepare to support the children. So we've been spending hours to make sure we, we calculate it. There was a full power with the schedule because what we envisioned that was gonna happen in person did not translate into the schedule in power school. So it is true, perhaps when the parents go into power school, they're not, it's not mirroring exactly what's happening in the building. And so since then we have a scheduler who's helping us out. I suppose from that end also, they're not used to having children repeating two days and have not figured out quite how to make it reflect in power school. If Fabienne was in on a Monday, Fabienne is also in, in a different cohort on a Thursday and Friday. Yeah. So this is where we are. Yeah, so, you know, as I said, there are gonna be some bumps along the road and one of them has to do with our uh, power scheduler. But overall, um, I have had comments from Gibbs parents that, uh, that the experience of the last few days has been very positive. And I didn't know if there was any other principal. I just wanted to give a quick overview of how the first couple of days have gone. Um, sure, Kathy, I can, I can go next. Okay. Um, so, I, you know, I think admittedly, a lot of us were anxious coming back to school. We have not seen kids since March uh, 13th, but it was nice to see over 300 students on Monday and see a different cohort of students on Thursday. So, um, you know, it was great. The kids were fantastic in lining up and, and getting directions. Uh, we really lucked out by getting some good weather so we could be going outside for lunch and it helped us organized outside. Um, I just wanna thank the staff. I think they were great. They were flexible. They were really helping out kids. And I think about 9, 9.30 on that first day in Monday, we were like, okay, this is school. There's less kids and there's masks and there's more rules and there's more, more protocols, but we got 13 and 14 year old kids ready to learn and we're ready to teach. So I thought overall it went extremely well. I've talked to people who are in the remote academy and they seem like that has gone extremely well. People getting used to the Zoom links and the Zoom breakouts. So um, overall, I'm really happy. Um, obviously still nervous of what will happen the next few weeks with health and other um, things that might be a little bit out of our control, but 
you know, I think if you walked into the Audison Middle School sometime this week, you would see pretty happy kids, a little bit tired. Um, you know, it was difficult being in some classes and you can't see facial expressions because half their face is covered up. But uh, I think overall, it wasn't perfect, uh, but I think it went very well. And I think that speaks to uh, the teachers who were great, but also to the students. They were fantastic in the building. And I think families did a great job of preparing them to get ready to school and to um, get back to business. Thank you, Mr. Marringer. Um, and yeah, I think can I jump in too? Can you hear yeah, me okay? Sarah. Yep. Um, I'm sorry, I'm in transit. So I pulled over in the car. Don't worry, I'm being safe. But um, I just really wanted to say how happy everyone was to be in school this week, both in person and online. I think coming the messages coming from the remote academy were incredibly positive. Um, I heard from many, many families and students that they were feeling really good about that experience um, and that in person too, it was just, it was different, but there were also pieces of the in-person arrival um, that were really special in the fact that I think the smaller numbers of kids coming into school was allowing the, the whole scene to be just a little calmer for everyone. We had, um, I would have to say at Hardy Elementary School, we had zero tears coming in and often in kindergarten, there can be a difficult transition. Um, and just that we were all so impressed and the teachers kept commenting on how well the children were doing um, with all of these new things that we're putting in front of them. And I spent, you know, my days outside with them. We've been working really hard to keep a schedule in which, and like Mr. Marringer said, the weather was beautiful, so we were outside, and today was a beautiful day. And just everyone is going, I think, to fall into a new kind of, of normal, but it, it, there are a lot of really great positives, and we just were really proud of how well the teachers and the students and the families are all working hard to make this um, a great first week. So thank you, everyone. Thank you, Ms. Parrott. And Congratulations for a great start. Um, I, I, I'm happy to have somebody else that would like to comment. Uh, the person who has done Yeoman's work to have our remote academy have a successful start is uh, uh, Sam Carustis, who is the assistant principal at Dallin. And I, would you like to say a couple of words about how the start went? Sure, thank you everybody. Thank you. Um, I think we had a, a meeting with teachers on Monday and everybody was very energized and wanted to share that really the kids seemed eager to be there. Um, it was definitely an unusual experience for them to be on screen a lot of the time, but the kids were really engaged in Google Classroom and jumped back in willingly and ex you know, excited about it. Um, they said it was a much better day than they expected, and they're having to get used to the pacing of the day because it's so much different than being in person. Um, but we've kept in touch with them throughout the week, and we're, um, as you can imagine, trying to address some of the bumps in the road, but it's been great. The staff has been fabulous, and I can't wait to get into more of the classrooms and see how things are going. So everybody's done a great job. Thank you very much. So I, I, I think that every, unless there's somebody else who would like to say something, I think you get an idea of that uh, from these reports that overall it was a very positive experience this week. And I'm not going to minimize that there were some bumps that we have to um, uh, look at and uh, one of which has to do with um, uh, some of our protocols around uh, COVID. We've had, um, we've had a couple of situations this, this, this week uh, which are each unique, actually. Um, uh, in two of our cases that we had an issue around COVID, uh, this was the result of the testing program that we entered in a partnership with uh, the, the Arlington uh, Department of Health and Human Services in doing testing of staff members. More than half of our staff actually um, participated in this program. And it was from that testing that we found um, on Sunday that we had a, a staff person at Pierce 
who had uh, tested positive. But this was our goal. Our goal was that we would try to minimize the, um, the possibility of COVID cases, um, virus coming into our school buildings. And in that sense, it did, it did achieve that goal. However, because of the level of contact tracing involved um, and, and, and the people who were designated as close contacts, uh, we felt that the building, and I say we, I also include the Department of Education and um, the um, Department of the Board of Health in Arlington, that we needed to delay um, in-person learning just because of staffing issues. Uh, in fact, there have been several programs that have continued to run this week um, at Pierce because it's not an issue about the building itself. Um, and actually, we have Principal Amadi here. I don't know if you wanted to say anything about the experience this week on that. Sure. Um, thank you, members of the school committee, for allowing me to speak tonight. Um, and thank you, Dr. Bodie, for your rapid response um, over the weekend, as well as um, Cindy Sheridan Curran. Um, so due to the, the facts that we, we figured out about halfway through Sunday, we had to uh, divert from our original plan to open as planned on, on, on Monday. and. Um, informed our teachers of the decision that we were going to go with Sunday afternoon, and I was so impressed with um, the level of work that they did uh, throughout the evening Sunday night to be able to open in a way that was organized, that students had a really meaningful first day, um, and, I, and I couldn't say more. I can't say more about um, how wonderful the staff responded. Um, of course, we were disappointed, um, and then we got over that, and, and, we, and we switched gears. And uh, on Monday, I was able to go through a, a, a bunch of classrooms and I saw happy students. Um, school was well attended. Teachers were working on systems and routines from the remote aspect of learning. And um, all things considering, um, I think it was a, a wonderful first day um, for our students and for our teachers and, um, and, our, and our families. Um, you know, were awesome in this. They, they, they had to change what they were doing in a matter of hours and I commend them as well. So um, thank you to the Pierce faculty and, and everyone involved in that. Um, and thanks for your time this evening. Thank you very much. And thank you for your leadership over the weekend too. We spent a lot of time together as we worked it all out. And uh, your, your staff and your students and your parents all need to be commended. Um, we had another incident at Thompson, which everyone is aware of, um, in which we also had a situation where we had a positive case. And this also came from the testing program um, that we had initiated with the, the, with the Board of Health. Um, so in this particular case, a lot of what we had already planned out came, you know, became necessary that we had to quarantine two classrooms and then some of the uh, some of the adults in the um, in the school. Now, in, in our planning all, for the last couple of months, our plan has been to keep students as best as possible in cohorts, so that we don't have you know students mixing among each other, so that we have to actually close down an entire school. And that's exactly what happened in this situation. We were able to limit. Uh, the amount of quarantine that was necessary. This may actually, if this is all right with you, Ms. Morgan, um, I have with me um, uh, Dr. Franke and also Cindy Sheridan Curran, who have been part of the planning. And um, Ms. Curran is our liaison to the uh, uh, Department of, of Health and Human Services. And even though it's a little bit further on, it's the next thing on the agenda, before we talk about curriculum, which I know Dr. McNeil is looking forward to talking about, um, could we have them uh, join in the conversation at this point? Sure, that'd be great. I wanna pull the discussion about health metrics and learning model transitions, yep. so we keep that, like if we can try to be tight to our will keep us all on, on track. Okay. Right. I don't know if either one of them would want to add any comments, but I, we'll, we'll hold the health metrics off until the next agenda item. All right. Uh, Dr. Frankie? Hmm. 
Maybe they're not on here. Oh. All right, well, let's go on then. Uh, we'll come back to any questions She's about here. this. She is here. here. I, I see her. Oh. They're both here. I don't know if they can hear us, though, because can they hear us? Yes, sorry about that. There was some background noise, and I didn't oh. hear the question. I didn't know if you wanted to add any comment about our experience this week in terms of um, the quarantine of the classes or the, um, the situation where we had to have a whole school go remote. Well, I mean, there were, there were two very different reasons for having one go remote and one be uh, going through mm -hmm. quarantining. And um, in terms of the quarantining, it, it went quite well. I thought at the Thompson, it was a pretty smooth situation. Um, uh, we had a nice meeting, it went quickly. Uh, we moved things along. Uh, Board of Health got involved the next morning to help take over things. Um, and I do know that uh, folks at Thompson, uh, Cindy mm -hmm. and Christina did a lot of the contact tracing themselves because it was evening and okay. they felt it was very important to get that messaging out. Um, and I think so too, I think it was a wise decision. Um, Board of Health did follow up with those families the next day so that there was consistency and dialogue. Um, mm -hmm. And in terms of the remote with Pierce, it, it made sense. It was, it was a numbers game and mm -hmm. it made sense why we had to go in that direction. Um, I don't think anyone was necessarily at risk if you had started school the next day, but it wouldn't have been a smooth transition. So I, it was a good move all around. Thank you for your help with it as well, and as well as Ms. Curran. Um, in the overview um, of the opening, there's two more reports. One is from Dr. McNeil and one is from Mr. Mason. And um, Dr. McNeil, do you want to, unless the school committee wants to have any questions right now? So let's do Dr. McNeil and Mr. Mason and then. Perfect. Then move on. Okay. Yeah. And then, then we'll do questions on this piece before we move on. Yeah. Okay. So I, I have a really short report. I echo Dr. Bodie's um, sentiments about opening day. I applaud our building administrators uh, for the work that they've done in order to prepare for our first day. I've heard wonderful reports about how things um, unfolded. Uh, we did have, and, and one of the things that, I, uh, that school committee members have asked about is Zoom. And I am so happy to report that we did not have any major incidents of students not being able to connect um, or to access their remote classes mm -hmm. uh, using Zoom. So it was a success. Of course, we had a couple of isolated incidents, which you know you always anticipate not everything is going to go perfect, but as as it relates to some of the things that I was thinking about um, in you know, had a little bit of anxiety about for the first for the first day was the operation of using Zoom. And it was a I again I say it was a success. We did have a couple of um glitches, technology glitches with our Dreambox, which is now resolved. So parents should be able to access Dreambox. And I want to thank our math director uh, Matt Coleman and our uh, director of digital learning. Uh, Dr. Susan Bisson for working through those uh, issues and we are still working on Seesaw. So um, I've asked uh, teachers not to put activities or assignments into Seesaw, which is for our kindergarten through second grade students uh, for yesterday and today as we work through the issues and hopefully it will be up and running uh, for Monday. So that uh, concludes my report. Overall, it was, uh, I think it was very successful. Uh, with our technology and um, I look forward to you know the days that are coming up and hearing more great reports from our building administrators. Okay. Thank you Dr. McNeil and Mr. Mason. And I'm sorry I also want to thank our staff. I, we could not have done this without our teachers, uh, support people, um, everybody has chipped in and it was definitely a team effort with our building administrators and all of our staff. Sorry, thank you. Yes. Um, uh, for, in tonight, I'm, I want to discuss our up, uh, updates on our efforts to ensure the safety of our students and staff. Um, 
First, I want to start out with discussing our efforts to ensuring our buildings were safe to reopen in occupancy uh, for reoccupancy. And um, uh, the safety of our building occupants was, was and continues to be our top priority. I would like to acknowledge the efforts of Jim Feeney and the facilities team that spent hours upon hours on prepping the schools for reoccupancy. And normally in the summer, uh, the staff does routine maintenance of buildings and take on special capital projects while the buildings are unoccupied. However, not only did this team do their normal work, they did complete their work above and beyond to ensure that our buildings were safe, healthy, and that all the equipment needed for reopen was working as designed or intended. So I would like to thank them for all their work to get us to this milestone uh, to reopen. Um, however, uh, you know, the, that work included many things that we've already discussed previously, which included making sure the ventilation equipment uh, was working properly, meeting the standards, showing that faucets were fixed in the district uh, so that sinks could be used for the increased hand washing and sanitizing. In some cases, when faucets had, uh, had timers or mechanisms to set a certain amount of the water flow, those were just to meet at least the 20 seconds that were required. Um, placing hand dryers throughout the districts uh, with contact paperless tower dispensers and uh, making sure that we have contact, contactless water fountains or turning off contact water fountains with uh, touch-free bottle filling stations. And that, that work will still remain ongoing. Um, also the facility team made sure that all tents were ready uh, for reopening and uh, for to be used for alternative outdoor spaces for, uh, for instruction or eating or mass breaks. And you know, all the work that they, that they did to prepare for the reopening, um, they also have to do and continue to work to make sure our buildings remain clean. And so this week, uh, you know, yesterday, they did their first uh, electrostatic treatments uh, after the, the school buildings have uh, been reoccupied um, to hopefully mitigate risks of the current coronavirus. Um, and throughout the day, they've providing additional cleaning uh, to high frequency touch points, which uh, would include door knobs, crash bars, you know, bathroom faucets, elevator buttons. I was in the elevator one day, I saw them. It was, it was great to see that all this work was actually being done. And, um, and between cohorts, you know, on Wednesdays, they're making sure that, the, that they treat these classrooms to make sure that the, the next group of students are, are ready to go in. So I, I, I'm really proud of this, this group of people. Um, and we, they came up with an elegant way, I'd like to show that elegant way um, that um, they display when a, a room has been electrostatically treated. If you don't mind, I'll, I'll share my screen real quick. Um, and this is something that is left uh, by, by the custodial team. Uh, and teachers and students will walk into a classroom, they'll see something similar to when they walk into like a hotel to make sure that it's been cleaned and everybody's realizing that, you know, this, the space is ready for occupancy. I also, uh, in order to reopen the schools, we had to make sure that the buildings were safe. We have all the PPE, the, distribu the distribution of the PPE, and I want to thank uh, Sue Franke um, and our procurement specialist, Neil, Neil Amon, for all the work that they did to make sure that we had locked in the, the, the supplies and made sure that we had a, a starting amount and that we continue to make sure that we have masks, um, desk shields or bar plexiglass barriers, gloves, gowns, lab coats, and any other thing like such as sanitizing wipes or any clean materials that we need uh, during, this, during this time. Mm -hmm. Also wanna thank the transportation department. They, everything has been going smooth. And even with uh, you know, the transportation this, uh, department starting the year with just two drivers uh, down, 
um, not not with two drivers, but two drivers down and f down four monitors for leaves. And you know, I want to acknowledge Steve Angelo, who who has made it work with this limited staffing resources. Um, and hopefully, this will improve. But due to those staffing issues, we yes, as we brought up to you last meeting, we did have to suspend the Bishop bus, but. Otherwise, we've made it work for all the other requirements that we need for the transportation and everybody's driving on the bus safely and three feet apart, at least um, per the guidance and with masks on all, all times and buses are electrostatically clean between the runs, which is very important because uh, there's different students on the buses as we are doing double runs on each of these buses. I also, my last part, I want to take the time to discuss, uh, opportunity to discuss what an amazing job that uh, Denise has done with the food services team and uh, has been doing with serving breakfast and lunch to the students of Arlington. Denise and her team have stepped up to the plate uh, since schools closed in March, as well as everybody else in the district. And uh, the small core group of, of, the, of the Thompson Food Service staff helped prepare food to continue feeding the students throughout the closure. Um, and weekly deliveries were made, providing seven days worth of food during that time. And at this point in time, over 65,000 meals have been pro uh, provided to families of Arlington for all of these efforts. And I'd also like to acknowledge all of the volunteers who stepped up to support these efforts. Some of those included IT personnel, school nurses, deans from the high school, and several bus uh, and, and bus drivers um, that help deliver meals to families. As, as you may know, uh, as you may or may not know, Arlington does not typically qualify for summer feeding programs. Um, so when the schools closed in March, the USDA did provide a waiver that would allow districts to provide meals to children in, Mar uh, in March. And there, there are actually currently two bills that uh, is pending with Congress that could possibly grant the USDA the authority to extend that waiver for this whole academic year. So I, I, I keep our fingers crossed for that to be approved. However, we're thankful that our current waiver is available until the, the end of this calendar year, December 31st. Uh, now that schools have reopened in person, food service is still providing lunches for students in person and remote, uh, which definitely causes some logistical issues. Each school, uh, handles lunch differently uh, and you know they are working close to tandem with uh, the principals to make sure that the right amount of meals are getting served at each school. Um, and then on, t on Tuesday night when I was trying to discuss what to say for this evening, uh, Denise was working with her team late. It was 9.30 at night trying to prepare meals for our meal kits for Wednesday. Um, and they, yesterday, they, they served over 800 families that signed up, which was more than what they did in the summer, which they end up serving 1,400 meal kits, which was over 14,000 meals since 10 meals are in each meal kit. Um, it was an amazing effort to see all of this being done. Um, and, you know, these meal kits include many great foods and families who have not already signed up can sign up on a Google form that is posted on the district's website. Yeah. Currently, uh, we'll be working through the challenges as, as we get more people that do sign up, uh, we're gonna have to look at different ways to handle this uh, mm -hmm. as we may not be able to deliver to everyone. We may have to look at other alternatives of way, methods of delivering uh, the food service, uh, these food, the, food, the food kits, okay. the meal kits. Right. But I also just, if I just have one second just to show just all the work that it takes to, to do this. I uh, just show you a couple pictures of them and then I'm done with my part of the report. Sorry for taking so long. And so this is some of all the meal kits that they served last night. Um, well, that they were preparing on Tuesday night to be delivered on Wednesday. And some of them actually had that delivered today on Thursday because they weren't able to deliver to everybody uh, due to limited resources. But um, 
This is Denise and some of her teams. This, it just, it just just shows the, the amount of work that goes into this and all the food and whatnot. But um, okay. that's, that's the end of my part of my report. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Mason. Um, Denise Boucher and her team have been outstanding. Uh, I think what is particularly commendable besides managing all of this increase in home deliveries is that she's also um, uh, still having school lunches in all of our buildings. So it's been a uh, uh, terrific. So before we go on to um, uh, the next part of the agenda has to do with um, COVID incidents and metrics, does anybody want to ask any questions? Um, Ms. Exton, I'm assuming everybody's going to have questions. So if you don't, you can pass. But. Um, I just wanted to start by um, echoing the thanks that the administration um, has already said to principals, to teachers, to the Pierce teachers for being particularly flexible. I can't imagine the night before you're expecting to start in person to switch to remote, um, to the nursing staff and the custodial staff that have gotten the buildings um, ready for our students. I appreciate all, all of your work. Um, I just have a few sort of tech questions, I guess, for Dr. McNeil. Um, where, I know this gets asked a lot, but where do we stand on um, email access for like fourth and fifth graders? Have we decided that that's not happening? Yeah, we, we are looking at an alternative. I really don't wanna sh share it right now, but we do, we're, we're exploring something, um, a, a tool that can uh, replace uh, the email. So we are going to explore that. I understand that we have a demand for email, but um, we're still sticking to our um, concern about opening email for uh, students at the elementary level will be uh, problematic. So we're looking for an alternative. Okay. And is that, I guess, so I understand not doing email for even younger students, but I'm just wondering if there's something in the works for making it easier for like the early elementary to access like their Zoom links themselves you know parents get them as an email and then are sort of trying to figure out how to get it to their student on their student's device um and just i don't know i just want to know that that's something that's sort of being thought about and addressed to make well the access to zoom links we have the google classroom and that's where the kids can that's where the link for the a zoom is so they have to click on to google classroom and then they click on the zoom link and then they're on the meeting. Okay, so, so that is something that kids can learn um, how to do independently. And then uh, that's where we're looking at also using Seesaw, where the activities will go into Seesaw, and then they will be able to access that. So, um, Which is what I just want to mention about Clever. Yes, well, Clever is a SQL sign on. So, Clever is where the there's a link. Okay, so. To answer your question about the Zoom, they click on the Google Classroom and then they go and click on the Zoom link and then that's how they access their meeting. The Clever link is also in Google Classroom. So when students click on Clever, it gives them, it's a single sign on and they can access, you know, Raz Kids, uh, Dreambox, um, uh, Lexia Core 5, Scholastic Pro at the elementary level. And then the same thing will happen uh, at the secondary level where they have the clever link is embedded in um, is linked into Google Classroom and then that's where the students at the secondary level can do the same and access all of the online tools we have purchased for students to utilize. Okay, and that, that's still sort of being worked out and I understand that. No, it's is not. Clever is up and running. The only thing we're working on is now we do have uh, parents that have emailed and we've tried to make sure that they understand the process. And so that's where we, and I've done it too, I've been made myself ac accessible uh, to answer emails and Dr. Bisson and our uh, technology specialists have been responding to parents' requests about spy ponder accounts, resetting the, uh, uh, the passwords. So we're trying to make sure that we're able to troubleshoot individual situations but Clever is operational. The only thing that we need to work on is uh, 
to my knowledge, is the uh, seesaw at the elementary level um, in order to get that up and running. Okay, so K to two still doesn't have access to seesaw, so they don't have access to their own Zoom links yet. Is that no, 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 no? If they go into Google Classroom, which has nothing to do with seesaw, right. they so can I access the Zoom link in order to click on the Zoom link to access the um, the um, uh, the you know the virtual meeting or the class meeting with their teacher. I um, so I. Maybe it's one class at one school, but my son does not currently have access to Google Classroom or Seesaw. The teacher, okay. has, the teacher has so far emailed the Zoom link. I, and I, I totally get that this is day four. I, I'm, I understand it's coming. If it's coming, that's fine. But I just, I want to know that it's something in the process. Well, the, the Google Classroom should be set up. Uh, by all teachers. So that is something that um, I will, uh, if you send me an email, I will definitely follow up on it. All right. I think that's okay. Thank you. Thanks, Ms. Warren. Uh, Mr. Cardin. Great. Um, so I also want to thank the principals and the teachers, especially. There's been a lot of good feedback about how hard the teachers are trying. Um, and I think uh, that's showing and, and creating a lot of goodwill. So thank you to all the teachers. Um, there, there is still some issues, you know, there's, there's always gonna be bumps. There is still some issues, but in, and they're mainly related to communication. It's not, you know, it wasn't clear at the high school what kids were supposed to be doing on Wednesday. Uh, it wasn't clear at Gibbs and Audison. Some elementary schools, the teachers were very clear and some weren't. So. Again, if we can, we need to over communicate um, about everything. And so um, I, I do hope that I know everybody pulled in a hundred different directions, but we can short circuit some of the, the, the questions and the pain by again, communicating, assuming people don't know, people have not, assume people have not read our 90, 90 page reopening plan and, uh, and, and communicating things as much as possible. Um, I did have, since we discussed the, the quarantine that, that occurred this week, I, I did have an, a question for Ms. Sheridan or, or, or Dr. Franke about where the um, decision to quarantine classes, I know that's in the, the document that was sent to parents, it's not in the state DPH DESE standard, it's not in the CDC requirements, so I'm curious about where that came from and what the thinking was behind that. I think I can speak on that a little bit. Um, so that is a fluid situation and we have to align ourselves with the Board of Health and that kind of decision making. It's not something that as a district we just make alone or unilaterally. Um, it's in alignment with our Board of Health and with DESE. Anytime there's a case, we actually do have to notify DESE of it and they are supposed to help with the process of decision making. Um, so, but did, Des so, did Desi recommend did Desi recommend quarantining the whole class? Well, I wasn't the one to call Desi, so I don't know what the specifics are in terms of their recommendations. So, okay, I, could, I mean, we have we have a blanket. Sorry, go ahead, Ms. Sheridan. If I could just step in, so we don't decide, we don't uh, um, decide on the quarantine. The, the Board of Health decides who is going to be quarantined and who is considered a close contact. This was decided quite a while ago that in a classroom situation, when we've got students and adults mixing for the entire day, that to not consider that cohort as close contacts would be impossible. Um, as you don't know, you know, when a teacher's turning around and, and um, you know, doing something and the kids have a chance to kind of get closer together and the teacher may not see that immediately, um, to try to kind of sort through things that happen through the entire length of a day is impossible. So a decision was made a while ago that the, that the cohorts would be considered close contacts in that situation. Um, and again, this is, these decisions are made with the goal in keeping our schools open um, versus taking the chance that we're going to um, not understand what kind of contact could have been made and then leave people in a building that may have been exposed and may now be um, a positive case. 
just spreading it around the building. So, so uh, these decisions are all made in w with the goal being to keep our buildings open. So in terms of, of um, a classroom that we've decided that a cohort that's together all day long is considered close contacts. We did that with the guidance of the Board of Health for sure. And again, once that decision's made, the Board of Health is the one that issues a quarantine. We don't issue quarantines. Um, and just to address something else earlier, to be clear, on the school side, we don't actually do contact tracing. Um, we assist with it. Um, and we help kind of identify who may be close contacts in the school building and we provide that information to the Board of Health. Um, and there's a lot of reason to make sure that we're assisting getting messages out, but we're not the ones who are delivering um, the quarantine from a legal perspective. Um, but we are helping deliver some information and no matter who we call, the Board of Health then makes calls. So for example, if we are calling a staff member that we have been, uh, that's been identified or a student or anybody in a building that's been identified as a positive case, we are giving them the information so they're not walking in our buildings the next day. Um, the follow, the, the Board of Health then contacts them as well. And in all of these cases, the Board of Health is involved at the beginning. So in the cases that we've seen in Arlington so far, the Board of Health is generally the one who finds out first. And then they go to work right away on, on the positive case and then working with us to kind of walk through the movements of that particular individual. Right. So, so something we'll follow up with, with the Board of Health. Um, I, I'm not questioning the, the decision, um, but it's different than what the State Department of Health and DESE is recommending, right? So they don't say quarantine the whole class. They say a close contact is six feet for more than 15 minutes. Correct. So it's not the situation of a teacher turning around for five minutes and not seeing what's going on. It's 15 minutes of contact within six feet is their standard. It's great if we decide to have our own standard, but I, I do want to hear more from the whoever made that decision, specifically the rationale for that, for going above and beyond what's being recommended by our state health authorities. So we'll work on that. Well, we we do know that piece. Um, you, you're absolutely right. DESI and DPH collaborated with those guidelines and that guideline was it's fairly new. Um, that wasn't out two months ago. That's a fairly new guideline. Um, and we did discuss it in a principals meeting with the Board of Health. And at that time, it was their decision to stay with that using the definition of the class, the cohort, or, or all the kids in the bus. You know, all those kids in the bus, all those kids in the class, or the cohort are are going to be considered close contact. So that didn't come from the school. Uh, that came from the Board of Health. Yeah, I mean, they, I, I did ask them. They said it came from the school plan. <laughs> it's not in the August 10th draft of our safety plan. So I don't know where it came from originally. Was, that's, that's what we'll need to, to explore. And yeah, just make sure that that's was, the right decision for, I mean, it may be the right, it's certainly probably the right decision for a kindergarten class. But I think we need to think about whether that's the right decision for a fifth grade class, for an entire cohort at the middle school. And so I think we'll have a meeting about that um, with, with the, the correct parties. Um, and then um, uh, the special education stuff, we'll, we'll wait till that's a separate item, uh, agenda item. Thank you. Um, Dr. Allison Ambi. Sorry, I have to keep my video off because my internet is flaky and I'm going in and out today. Um, so I echo everything, everyone, um, I echo everyone's thanks for, uh, to the administration, to our principals, to our teachers, and to our students um, for everything they've done to get the year off to a start. Um, I guess I, I've heard some of the questions that my colleagues have asked. The one thing I hadn't heard yet is I'm wondering, I also heard of situations on the ground being very different than what was described by Mr. McNeil and, and I forget who else about where links were and whether they could find them and when they came in and, and things like that. And also that there was some confusion about the Gibbs doors and um, not just for special education students, but I'm wondering what, if anything's being done in terms of seeking feedback from parents so that you can see where 
you can understand where the communications breakdowns have occurred um, and just the types of things that people are missing. Um, I don't know that it has to be a formal survey, but just you know, talking to people and, and capturing the information and promulgating it out would be helpful. Um, that's all. Uh, Mr. Thielman. Thanks very much. I, I, you know, the beginning of a school year is always a challenge and there's always logistical uh, challenges. So, uh, and this year is obviously an extraordinary year. So I wanna thank and congratulate uh, everyone, uh, Mr. Mason for getting the facilities ready and uh, Dr. Bodie and Dr. McNeil and uh, all of the principals. I think, I hope it sounds like based on a few conversations I had with uh, friends who are teachers in the Arlington Public Schools that uh, they it felt good to be back in school. Um, and it felt good to be back in front of our kids, whether it was uh, remote uh, or partially in, or in person with, with smaller groups. Um, it, uh, and so congratulations to all. It's never easy to get the school year off to, to, to a good start. And uh, I'm, I'm sure you're making notes and learning. Uh, a couple of questions uh, that I have are, um, one question, I guess this is for Mr. Dr. McNeil, is that there was a, a specific question um, that I forwarded, uh, which is about students in the remote academy. Um, uh, they don't get snow days. Those in the, in the, uh, in the hybrid program do. Are there, are, so one is, is that going to be addressed? And two, is there a, a plan to kind of take a look at any um, discrepancies or differences between student experience in the hybrid and the remote model, study it over the course of the year, so modifications can be made either during the year or in the future? Oh, absolutely. I, uh, I'm in close contact with the, you know, we have an elementary principals meeting. We had one today, uh, and Ms. Liner and Ms. Karustas are there uh, with the other elementary uh, principals. I'm in close contact with the other building administrators. Um, so yes, I, I definitely, I'm interested in being able to compare and contrast the experiences between students in the remote by choice program and our hybrid program. And uh, so we have conversations every day about different things. And, and I will say this week, uh, we have had uh, parents reach out. Like I said before, I've made myself available and we're trying to you know, answer questions and uh, address individual situations as, as quickly as possible. So the, and then the specific question is, this came up, uh, uh, two or three parents uh, emailed me about, uh, they might've all been talking to each other uh, and about uh, snow day, I guess. Okay. That, that, that I'm oh. gonna yield that to Dr. Bodie because okay. uh, um, you know, she's the superintendent. I mean, she's, that's okay, yep. fall into her purview. Yep. Well, we, we certainly don't want a difference between a hybrid and a remote programs in that regard. Um, I think everybody should just be patient for the Department of Education to uh, make some announcements in the next coming weeks. Uh, okay. But um, no, we're not going to have two different experiences. Okay, all right, great. Um, my other question is, um, what is the, the system of quality control you're using to um, understand user experiences throughout the district. I, like Ms. Exton, um, I've, I've heard from uh, parents who have said, great, no problem. Uh, I've also heard from parents who said they, they had trouble getting on Google Classroom or whatever the situation was. Um, and uh, my advice has been to talk to your principal. Um, so I'm just wondering, is there, is there like a, a method of quality control in which you're gathering data from the schools uh, to get a sense of the user experience. I know this is the first week, but is it so? One, are you doing this, and two, is it something that can, you can do going forward? Oh yeah. So I would echo what you, what you just said. So I want to, you know, say this to Miss Exton and any other parent who has who's having difficulty. In order for us to address the situation, we need to understand what the situation is because every situation is different and it's, and it's nuanced, right? So what I recommend is that. You know, if a parent is having difficulty signing on to Google Classroom, that they reach out to the classroom teacher to make sure that the classroom teacher has set up the Google Classroom, uh, because that is the primary way that we're, that's where we're embedding the, the links that students will need, like Clever, like the Zoom link, 
um, in order to get onto their virtual meetings. So then if it's, if it's a technology error, then that teacher will fill out a help desk ticket and submit it to our tech department. Uh, we also have uh, technology specialists at each level. We have one at the elementary level, we have one at the middle school level, and we will have one at, at the high school in order to address certain situations as it relates to resetting spy ponder, passwords, and then if it's something beyond that person's um, ability or knowledge, then they could fill out a help desk ticket. So we use those help desk tickets to understand what are the things that are happening system wide. And that is how I knew because parents were emailing me directly that we had a problem with Seesaw. And so then I took that information and then I would discuss that with um, Dr. Bisson, who was our digital learning, a director of digital learning. And then that's how we started to discuss, okay, what do we need to do in order to absolve the situation? The same thing with Dreambox, you know, we're looking and getting that feedback from the um, curriculum leaders as well, because they are in tune, they have discussions with teachers and coaches, and they're able to understand what is going on system wide. And so we can distinguish between something that might be a user, a specific user error, or something that's, you know, we can fix right then and there. Uh, if it's just like getting resetting a password and then understanding something that might be a more a, more of a systems error as it related to Dreambox and Seesaw. So, um, <laughs> Mr. Silman, I, I let me just add something on to what Dr. McNeil said. I think you're hearing that you're getting one source of, of quality control and information is directly email. I think there's a lot of anecdotal things that are happening. Principal standing out in front of the school talking to parents in the morning. I can tell you parents have not been shy about sending emails at all. So that's one source. But I do think that we, we had promised we would do this and we're going to do it, is to have a, a survey just to see how things are going. Uh, I think we should wait at least another week or so just to let things settle in a little bit better. But. Um, yeah, we do want to hear what's going well and what we need to improve upon. I, I don't think that anybody thinks that opening this week is a one and done situation. We have things to learn, things to improve, and we will. Um, and we will get that information from parents. And, and for that matter, teachers. Teachers, you know, they're very highly motivated to have this go well. And they are probably some of our best resources on this as well. Yeah, as I, and I just want to distinguish the fact that I was, I thought you were just addressing the uh, technology piece of it. So there are other sources that we can utilize in order to collect that data. But as it relates to the technology issues, we, we you know, if a, if a parent emails a teacher and that um, there's something that that teacher cannot, cannot resolve or the technology specialist, then we open up a help desk ticket and then our tech department. And that's a way that we collect data as it relates to the technology piece of this. Yeah, I, I was only addressing the the uh, technology piece, but I, I, you know, Dr. Bodie is correct that you know the plan is to uh, survey parents, and that makes sense. I'm wondering if you can get actual data on the number of students who have uh, logged on and not logged on to Google Classroom and all that stuff, and at some point share us some trend. Maybe the trend gets, maybe the number of students gets higher or lower over time. That's what I'm. At. Oh yes, because we do take a t that we yeah. also take attendance. So yeah. like when students That's sign on to their, we also can take attendance through the Zoom. Uh, platform that we have purchased. And so teachers have a record of when students sign on, how long they've been on. So yes, we can utilize that data to provide a report for you. Yeah. I mean, we've only had about 18, 19 hours, 20 hours of instruction. So I'm not expecting it now, but I'm just saying in the future, it'd be good to sort of get that data. Just Absolutely. Just, yeah. We can get that for you. And oftentimes, the, what I'm, the point I'm trying to make, I guess I didn't, I'm not doing a good job of it, is the data allows us to respond to the anecdotes um, more thoughtfully. Absolutely. Um, I, so, uh, Ms. Morgan, do we, so I know on the agenda we have something about the, I was going to, there was a conversation back and forth about um, that doctor, the doctor, Mr. Cardin started about, uh, the Dr. Cardin started uh, about uh, <clears throat> uh, nurses and public health. Is this, the, is this the time to ask these questions or do I wait? What do you want? What do you want so if it's related to um, metrics and learning model transitions, no. I would hold it. Okay. But if it's related to, we did within this topic talk about the, um, the Pierce Thompson situations or things that are tangentially related to that. It's related to that. So just Great. allow me. Now's the time. 
Okay, thank you for the clarification. Um, so my question to uh, Ms. Franchi, Frankie, uh, Ms. Frankie is this, is um, what is the system of quality control that you have to um, ensure that there is consistency um, in all 10 schools or all, you know, all, at least all the elementary schools and or the schools at each level um, in the administration of, of COVID rules? I mean, how does that, how are you, how are you, what's the quality control system to make sure that there's equality, there's consistency in each school? That each, in other words, so you don't have, you don't create a system in which, which has happened and can happen easily in any uh, sure. system in which individual principals and nurses may be doing what they think is best, but not in concert with the rest of the group. Right. So um, I don't know if people have had a chance to look at the family uh, guidelines as well as the staff guidelines. They are posted and they were posted before school started. Um, on there are very specific guidelines as to what the expectations are. Um, if there's a table of contents, Julie Dunn um, helped me to format it. You just click on it, whatever subject matter in the table of con contents, whether that's testing, contact tracing, attestations, whatever the subject matter is, and it bookmarks it, brings you right to it. Um, our guidelines are actually very similar to surrounding districts because I worked on these with the nursing directors in surrounding districts because the Department of Public Health was not at the table. Let me just back up a tiny bit. Millions of dollars are allocated from the state to something called the school health unit at the Department of Public Health. Uh, the Boston University has a large grant through that particular unit in which they create programming and, and education for not just school nurses, but other school health providers, social workers, occupational therapists, et cetera. So that is a tool that one can utilize. Well, nothing came. There was, it was like crickets, radio silence until about a week and a half before school started or two weeks before school started. But at that point, I had worked with all the surrounding towns to sort of create guidelines because we had no guidance. We had none. There was no health guidance for us. Um, Desi actually provided some in collaboration with DPH, but, but we weren't really getting it from our own team. So that is a very robust and long manual, which is why the, the bookmarked chapters are important to click into because otherwise it'll just be scrolling, scrolling, scrolling. Uh, so, so all that is there and has been there. Um, it was sent to principals to take a peek at and have them weigh in their thoughts. It was sent to the nurses. Um, Lots of people gave input. Um, recently, the Board of Health gave input. So that is in place. If I'm not sure if I'm answering your question. Oh, yeah, I know that. I, I know that. Uh, so I know the guidelines are in place. My question is, so, so I mean, by quality control, I mean the extent to which the principals and the nurses in all the schools at all the levels are um, the system you have in place to make sure everybody's checking in together uh, on a regular basis to mm -hmm. share experiences, to make sure there's consistency in the delivery uh, or the execution of the policies at the local level. So I, I get there's policies and I get they're written. What often happens in, in uh, any organization is that people read those policies and they might decide to, they might interpret them in, a, in, in their own way, unless yep. there's a system in place, a system in place in which every few days, every week or so, everybody's on a Zoom call talking about their experiences to make sure there's right. quality. And so in, in, that's by what I, what I mean by quality right. control. Because I mean, I guess it wasn't specific. So I, to what extent are you doing that? So I am doing that with the nurses. We do meet once a week. We started meeting before school even started. Um, not everybody wanted to or could due to vacations, et cetera. Um, but we do meet and we also have running dialogue. There's always conversations going on between our particular team. You know, why did somebody do something a certain way? Um, or why didn't they? And also, I get about, lately, about 300 emails a day. Uh, I get at least 15 phone calls a day. Half of those come from my team. So if they have a question about any of the policies that are in place, they know that they can get through to me. Um, but we do have those robust conversations and we call them best practices. We started that out long before COVID where people could bring um, something that they're doing in their particular building that seems to be working in another 
uh, provider says, oh, that's a great idea. Can you share that with us? And so it gives us this opportunity to have um, uh, almost like a small conference and that person is gonna lead it and tell us what are their best practices. And we've actually shared those out back in the spring with the schools. So the nurses do work quite collaboratively. They are in communications with each other sometimes with or without me, uh, depending on whether I'm available or not. But we do have our weekly meetings. Okay, I mean, I just, I just want to make, the, the, the point I'm trying to make is it, is it is, I think, at this moment in time, with, the, with COVID-19 in particular, because there's so much, there's obviously, it's, it, there's heightened attention uh, on this public health issue, obviously. Um, I just think it's super important for the nurses um, to be meeting on a regular basis, sharing best practices, talking about what they're doing with some involvement by the principals to make sure there's quality control and consistency across the district because um, the most, it, it's, it won't be a good thing for our town if, if somebody says, for example, my experience at, and I'm not picking anyone's school, by the way, my experience at Thompson is this way and my experience at, at, at Brackett is this way. Um, and so I just think that this is the time to make sure there's a good system in place. The second thing is, um, you know, this is, um, the first time in a long time that I that I can recall that we the school department and the uh, Department of Health and Human Services for the town I, I know you interact on a regular basis uh, and I know there's a lot of interaction I'm, I'm aware with, with who I'm sorry uh, there's interaction between the school department and the Department of Health and Human Services that's that's my broad point but this is the first time that it's it's um, really come to the school committee level it seems mm -hmm. and so could you describe kind of um, the extent to which um, the Board of Public Health, the Department of Public Health and Services, and the, the, the nurses and principals interface to get ready for the start of the school year? I started sending emails to the Board of Health shortly after COVID started. I think they were truly inundated. Um, it's a small department, in all fairness to them. And uh, I think they were quite busy. So they couldn't meet because I think they were busy. Uh, I sent numerous emails saying that we need to get ready for the fall. And I, they couldn't meet. A um, Couple of weeks ago, they did meet with us uh, and they met with the principals and some of the nurses were in on that meeting. So we did finally have that. Um, and we did meet with just the nurses. Um, and then there's uh, supposed to be a weekly meeting with them. Um, there's a lot of changes that were made in meeting dates. So that's been a little difficult to work with. Um, but that is from my level, that is the experience that I have had. So my, my request is this, is that we're, we're now in a, in a situation which I, I am not at all, I think makes sense in which the, the, the Board of Public Health is, the Board of Health is um, making decisions about closing classrooms and quarantining uh, children and uh, which are perfectly legitimate. And, uh, uh, but I think now more than ever, um, the school department and the Department of Health and Human Services have gotta be in lockstep talking all the time um, at all levels so that um, there's consistency in practice and good communication to parents and all stakeholders in the town. That's, that's my basic point. And I was inquiring to see to what degree that has happened over the summer, to what degree that is happening now. I'm, I'm, it's not good I'm hearing that they, there wasn't good communication over the summer, but that is critical. That is critical for this moment in time. Of course. Um, the community, I meet every day with the director of the Board of Health and members of that team, every day at noontime, and with, other, with um, uh, leadership in the town. So the communication has been ongoing and steady. I think that, you know, the situation we find ourselves in has been fairly overwhelming, really, um, yep. as we try to um, manage all the layers of uh, decisions that need to be made. Um, and I think that there's been an effort at the state level between DPH, Department of Public Health, and Department of Education, and the governor's office to try to coordinate as much as possible. But I think what everyone's finding is that there's more to think about 
and the implications of than you even realize until you sometimes get into the situation. Uh, I think the two incidents this week in the school department were very uh, a good learning experiences for us. And we're debriefing and we're talking about it. I've had numerous emails just in the last two days with the Board of Health. So it's, we, we are working at, the, at that and we, we, everybody understands how important it is. And honestly, it was from that communication at, in that meeting all summer that um, got us to the point where we had the testing program. I think we're one of two or three communities in the entire state that did this. So there's been a lot of working together over the last couple of months, and I expect that that will continue. Good, glad to hear it. And, I'm, and I do congratulate the district on the testing. That was a good, that was a coup for us. All right, thanks. That's, that's the end of my questions. Yeah, I think I took a lot of time. Thanks. Um, and just as another note, Mr. Thielman, we, um, I approached Dr. Bodhi earlier this week about setting up a um, either school committee special meeting or subcommittee meeting with um, uh, folks from um, the Department of Public Health on the town side, and they're absolutely open to meeting with us and have made themselves um, very available and uh, I am now stepping on Mr. Cardin's toes, but elected to send that to the CIAA subcommittee for lack of another place to send it because we don't we don't do a lot of public health stuff on the school committee side. So um, he is going to or with me and him we will uh, set up a meeting and make sure that all members are apprised. So um, I'm grateful that we're going to be able to do that too, um, Mr. Schlickman. Hey, good evening, everybody. Uh, congratulations on uh, on an opening. Uh, the two things that I really haven't heard, either here or from folks, uh, let me go through that. How do we do it opening Monotomy Preschool? How are we doing with the building and getting that up and running? I was going to share that with the special ed update. Uh, that's right. And do you want to hear right now from Ms. Elmer on that one? Uh, if it's covered later, that's fine. I, I okay. just didn't hear it at this point and certainly we're uh we've moved to a new building uh we're talking about making sure that opened on time uh we've been enthralled by stories of getting this thing on time and getting the elevator up and running uh so that's sort of hanging out there and the other one is um when last we talked we were in the middle of uh trying to schedule the high school in opening up seats by going all remote, and I'm wondering how things are going over there. I think Dr. Janger was here. I don't. Um, Dr. Janger, do you want to uh, weigh in on this question? Um, I, I will say, if, if you maybe try, I can see. I was asking you. just as my cover dropped to my lap. What was the question? How's the opening? Oh, um, well, you know, it's a little funny to have an opening when there's not a lot of people in the building. So you hear a lot of your um, information secondhand, but I think the opening has gone remarkably smoothly. Um, the sort of primary point of contact for the students who were in remote was really through the teachers. Um, and so they set up their Google Classrooms. I think we only had a couple of instances that at least elevated to my point of people not being able to find classrooms. I know there's a lot of connection going on at other levels as people came in. Um, and then we had uh, the special education staff um, really rallied because it was a big project for them in the two weeks um, where we reorganized the program to uh, reach out to every single special education student set up new learning plans and programs, um, and then plan how they were gonna come into the building, reorganizing spaces. A lot of them had to move during that two week period. So that was a huge project for them. And um, when I walked around on the first day of school, what you saw in every classroom was kids working quietly and teachers working with kids. And um, it was all the good things that you wanted to see. Uh, we had our first freshman orientation meeting um, where the 360 kids logged in, which is pretty much everybody in the freshman class. And we had a survey as a part of it, which was a good thing to do about how they were feeling. There were a bunch of other survey questions, but that was the one that 
was notable to me. And the overwhelming uh, two emotions that the students described were happy and tired. Mm -hmm. um, and if happy and tired is the, uh, the, the third day of school, then we're not so bad. But there are another about two to four percent that, um, you know, describe being sad or, or frustrated or um, worried. And those are the students that we're really working out on. Um, there was a big push, as we discussed at our last meeting, to make sure that we were connecting. So we have our attendance office working right from the start. And, and one of the things that, that was asked before, uh, Mr. Thielman asked about uh, data on student participation. And it's important to know that the state has asked us to change our attendance. So we actually have to affirmatively state that students are in class. So it's remote present or remote absent. So um, we should have good data on that, but that's been a process of reminding and changing norms. The toddlers, brought. sorry, can you come back in a minute, buddy? Okay, I'm on television, just wait one second. Um, so, uh, um, and the deans are following up actually in real time with students who are not logging in or showing up for classes. Um, and so we're really excited about that. Um, and then uh, the teachers, right out of the gate are really pushing hard on the reverse field trips. It took me until today to get the form out. Um, and the second I got the form out, it was just like they just started binging in. Um, so I think a lot of teachers are very excited about the prospect of finding ways to connect with their students. So in general, I think it's been a good start. Um, and uh, there's a lot of little things to work out and there'll be sort of two versions of the adjustment. Our, our, our staff and our community are not slow to let us know immediately in real time their concerns. So a lot of things we just change as we hear them. Um, but absolutely, there'll be surveys going out soon to find out more specific details. Thanks. Uh, and, and a follow-up, uh, recognizing it's only half the school year uh, and you're only scheduling half the school year, uh, where do we stand on the course satisfaction rate and getting kids into the courses they requested? That's an interesting question. I haven't run the uh, report. I will tell you that the uh, other people who've been working around the clock have been our school counselors. So I'm glad you asked that question because I left them off my list of people who are particularly snowed. And they're going pretty quickly right now through um, you know, dozens of meetings a day, shifting around kids' schedules, building kids' schedules. So that's a question I probably won't be able to answer reliably for a couple of weeks. But I think it looks like we've got a much more comparable ability to fill student schedules that we would in a normal year because of the expansion of the uh, the setting. Yeah, in many ways, you won't be able to tell until we get to the second semester because there's still that uh, flexibility there. But uh, that was sort of the thing that we were most worried about in terms of moving uh, into all remote. Well, one of the nice um, you know, things about the, this model of the semester, especially in this situation, mm -hmm. is um, there are problems that we can kick the next semester. So mm -hmm. if there's a section or an issue or a, a particular need that um, is not well staffed or well served in this, we can plan that for next semester. And we have held back a little bit of FTE to look at how we can staff those things in the second semester as well. That's why I thought the four by four block schedule was such a great idea under these circumstances. Thank you for all you've done. I'm just so impressed by what's been going on over at the high school. Thank you again. Thank you. Um, a sneak preview is that the elevator is working and the school is open. But I'll let Ms. Elma talk about that a little bit later. Uh, Mr. Hainer. Again, I'd like to echo what all my colleagues said. Uh, thank you to the staff, the administration. Um, an unofficial survey, uh, going, uh, watching the kids going to school down to the uh, Hardy School, smiles on their face. The smiles were still there in the afternoon every day this week, which is, uh, I managed to go by a couple of the other schools and saw that. One of the things I was just sitting here thinking, um, as a teacher, there's an opportunity every year to recharge your batteries during the summer. Didn't happen this year. And uh, we are fortunate to have uh, very well-educated parents and stuff. And as several of the people have said, they're not shy to get back to people. But I'd ask them to recognize with a little patience uh, the dedication of everybody here. We're all in the business, especially the teachers. 
to do the best they can for the kids. And uh, just a, a, and a lot of them have said thank you, but it's, a, it's an important thing. Thank you all. Um, so I um, obviously am humbled by the work of our educators um, on behalf of all of our children, um, especially my children, because <laughs> those are the people who I've connected with the most over the last, you know, four or five days. Um, and it's been, it's been extraordinary. Um, so, you know, a couple of notes, I think that I wanted to just make um, at, uh, at the Audison, um, Mr. Meringer has done a really great job empowering his assistant principals to also communicate with parents, which has been phenomenal. We hear both from him and from his staff um, and his teachers connect with our children. Um, and that has been extremely helpful. It's worked really well. Um, and so that's been, that's been really great as a parent to get, you know, two layers of communication. Um, and so I really like, um, seeing that I, um, you know, still, I, I'm disappointed that the district isn't looking at email for fourth and fifth graders. This is something that has been an issue for months and months. Um, I had two fifth graders last year. I have two sixth graders now and the experience of them being able to actually see their notifications in their email and work through it is uh, like night and day. So uh, for me, it's much better than it was in June, um, but I worry about, um, I, I think that an elementary solution when it comes to email and communication is not appropriate because kindergartner need, kindergarten needs and fifth grade needs are so different. Um, so I do find that to be uh, discouraging that we're still in this place where we're treading water around that. Can, um, I, can I just say I am exploring an alternative to email for the elementary level that's appropriate for that age group. And so we are trying to make sure that we get that in place. So. It is, I do believe it's going to be a solution. So it's not that I'm not hearing the feedback from parents. We're just looking at a different way that's a little safer and that we think that will be more appropriate for the elementary level. Great. I hope that it integrates as fully as possible with Google Classroom. That would be, that's the most important piece. Absolutely. Absolutely. Because yeah. the email communication piece, like, dear so-and-so, I need blah, blah, blah. Fifth graders, I don't know, need that. but. Um, to be able to say, Mrs. So-and-so posted an announcement or you received a comment on this, the ability to move through that um, on a list, I think is really critical, especially for students in the remote um, academy. I do think, um, you know, another piece that, um, you know, we, I, you know, Mr. Cardin talked about communication and, you know, absolutely just needing to continuously communicate, um, especially in those transition times, that fifth to sixth grade transition is really challenging. Um, even in normal circumstances, it's been especially challenging, I think, for people this year, especially for those who have their first child going into sixth grade. Um, and I, um, I think that a lot of the communication has been happening from teachers to students, which is extraordinary because teachers are magicians and they're getting the information to the kids, which is where it needs to be. And they're doing an incredible, my experience has been they're doing an extraordinary job doing that. Um, I do think we wanna continue to layer on the additional layers of communication um, to parents just so that they can feel like they know what's going on and they can step in. Um, so, uh, and then, you know, otherwise, uh, you know, I thought that, um, that Wednesday was, was, was interesting <laughs> and, uh, and, and, and fun in many ways, uh, which was nice. I don't have any high school students, so I do want to hear more. Um, and I'm going to ask Dr. Janger just to tell us a little bit more about what happened for the high schoolers on Wednesday. Um, one piece of feedback that maybe could be looked at at some point is, um, at the Gibbs, the decision was made to schedule band, chorus, and orchestra on top of um, an academic 
day on top of academic classes. So uh, for example, I have two students in band and one of them misses a 25 minute ancient civ class and one misses, a tw uh, one misses ancient civ and science for 25 minutes each. The other one misses break and math. Um, and while I'm grateful that I have two band students who then can combine and actually have had the full experience of the day, um, it's, it's a little tricky that we're having kids you know pulled out of those classes and I don't I'm not really clear on what's happening there I'm going to tape I'm going to provide that as feedback right now and table it as a question because I'm not I, I think it might be more appropriate you know at CIAA or elsewhere um, but Dr. Jager can you tell us a little bit or if you're still here about um, how Wednesday went from your perspective at the high school Sure. Um, sorry about the camera off. I, I pulled this downstairs and I'm now a little, le little less in the professional settings. So I'm going to leave it off for now. But um, yeah, so the, the plan with Wednesday was that students receive again their PE classes. So about half the school participates in a PE class, probably about a third on this Wednesday. And then all students participate in their advisory activities. Um, and the advisory activities was, you know, a series of a video a series of questions, a PowerPoint about sort of the start of school and social emotional learning um, with questions and then an exit ticket. And that'll be the pattern for every Wednesday. Um, and then an awful lot of clubs began to meet on Wednesday and we had the guidance, the, uh, during the X block, we had the meeting with, oh, and actually that was during the advisory, we had an extended advisory for the freshman class where we had the freshman meeting. Um, and so that's basically the model. Everyone took a breath. Students have independent work to do. Um, my experience just as a person who's got some, some uh, high school students is that the teachers have hit the ground running and so they're, they've taken to heart the concept that they've only got half a year to cover the content. And so there was a fair amount of getting organized on the part of the students to do their work and to figure out what they have to do this week. But that's the basic model, that there'll be club meetings, individual meetings with teachers, a uh, big chunk of the school do PE, there'll be advisory for everybody, um, and then there may be special events during the Xbox. Okay. All right. I will say this last piece that there was, there was a fair amount of, um, I think people expected to be more programmed a lot of people. And so people kept saying like, what am I doing during that time? And I was like, you're not programmed during that time. Right. And the X block, um, people were expecting that someone was going to tell them something to do, but it's club meetings and extra help, which is something we've done in the past and has been very heavily used. But in the first week of school, it's not usually something which is very heavily used. Dr. Jenger, what is the length of the day for the high school, like theoretically on Wednesdays? So well, the, I recognize there's limited programming. PE the, is the first three hours of the day, advisory is the next half hour, X block is an hour, and then we go to the teacher, the, the negotiated teacher prep starts at one. Okay. So, okay. All right. And, and at what time from between, I totally get the one o'clock thing and presume there's like a lunch prior to that, I would hope. Um, so, uh, people keep asking me about lunch um, and, and I, we do not have a lunch scheduled in the day and that's because nobody has um, every single one of those periods scheduled. So you can, the worst case scenario would be a kid who has a, um, what would it be, a 1045 PE class followed by advisory and wants to go to a club meeting. And so they would either eat at 1030 or at one, or they would eat during their club meeting. Um, so we didn't feel a need to put uh, an actual club break in there, a lunch break in there for the teachers or the students, because every individual actually has one. Okay, and um, what was my other question? So when are teachers available for students at the high school on Wednesdays? Um, so the X block is club priority, but teachers can use it, and then 8.30 to, um, 8.30 to 11.30 could be teacher availability time, depending on where their office hours, but an awful lot of groups have planned common planning times during that, grade level meetings during that time. Um, the special education CST meeting is during that time. Um, so primarily, I mean, people are meeting during that time as they've placed their office hours. People have office hours during X block, and then people have office hours before and after school for the 60 minutes. Okay. All right. Thank you. Um, all right. So the next um, 
I, uh, agenda item is a discussion around health metrics and um, learning model transitions. Um, so Dr. Bodhi, do you want to give an intro or Dr. McNeil or just go straight to Dr. Fonke? Um, I'll just say a couple of words and we'll go to Dr. Fonke. Um, uh, just as uh, for people who are listening and to remind you, you were given a metric that was put together with uh, different shades in terms of uh, cases per 100,000, which would determine whether you um, would be in remote. If you were in the red zone, you'd be in re remote teaching. So Arlington right now is still at around 0.5 incident rate. The state is at 0.8. And um, that bears significantly into any decisions you would have about school closure. And Mr. Card mentioned earlier uh, bringing Desi into these discussions. Uh, they were brought in on Sunday, uh, very much so, because it involved a school closure. Individual quarantine of classes is not something that they want necessarily to be involved in. But at any rate, um, I would like to, because Dr. Frankie has really been in a lot of discussions at the state level, local level, if she could talk a little bit about how the metrics um, that we, we've all seen plays a role in where we would go with um, decisions about a school closure or a district closure for that matter. Okay, thank you. So one of the things that we have to keep in mind is something actually that was said in the governor's talk today um, on one of his guest speakers is that when you're looking at metrics, they're referring to them as live metrics. Because we really can't just say, oh, and, and quantify 3% across the board and we're just gonna stick to that and that's that. It, it really isn't a realistic um, way to approach the problem. Let's say Arlington gets a 3% or even 5% bump up in, um, in COVID cases. Well, it really takes investigation as to look where those cases are. If they're in uh, a certain neighborhood because there was a party or if, there was an, if they were in long-term care facilities, then we have to really be cautious about do we shut down schools because of a situation like that. Um, and so I just wanted to bring that to light that this is, there's just too many variables involved in making a decision where you want some very good fidelity and in your decision process. So in the schools, if, you know, I was thinking about this, I thought, well, okay, if we're looking at maybe 300 kids and teachers in the school and 3%, we're looking at, you know, nine cases, let's say, um, would we shut down the school? Well, it also depends on where in the school it is. If it's all contained to one classroom, we, we may not have to shut down the school. But if it's scattered around the building, then that's something we have to take a serious look at. And all of those decisions are not made, we're not, a, we're not our own island as, as a district. We do have to work with the Board of Health and we do have to work in that situation with DESE. And then it becomes a question of, do they have a unit that they can bring in to help with testing? Um, I haven't had the experience. I've done testing, but not with that particular unit. So I don't really know how, how it works. It's pretty new. Um, and that's, so that's the ambiguity with working with th these metrics. It's the whole process of, is a bit nebulous. And again, I'd, I'd love to quantify it for you. We can go with a 3%, but then we have to look at, at the, as I said, the variables. Okay. All right. So let's do questions from folks around this. Um, I'm, I'm actually gonna go out of order and call on Dr. Allison Ampey first, just because this was something that she had asked about. And so um, I think that her questions might help frame the rest of us. So um, Ms. Exton and Mr. Cardin, I will be coming back to you shortly. So Dr. Allison Ampey. Okay. Um, so I don't, let me put this into context. The, the document that you have in front is the response that I received from the Director of Health after talking um, to Ms. Frankie and, and realizing, or Dr. Frankie, and realizing that it was most 
important to go on to the um, director of health um, because they are the ones who by I think by regulation are, are making the final um, call on a lot of this stuff. Um, and I just want to have a better understanding of how they were making decisions. Um, I, we just got this a couple days ago and I would like a chance to talk with them about it and have not been able to do so. And when we've been discussing having a board a, a meeting with the subcommittee and, and with them also. Um, I'm expecting I will have questions to bring to that setting, but I'm not sure I really have significant questions to bring up right now. So. Okay, great. Um, Ms. Exton? Uh, yeah, I mean, I guess I'm sort of um, along similar lines, just looking at this and it feels like the questions that I have, I don't know that the people here necessarily can answer. Um, so I guess I'll, I'll hold off, thanks. Okay, um, Mr. Cardin. Um, I'm actually, if, it, if okay, I'm gonna use this to ask about the testing program, is that okay? Yes. So, um, is there a plan to continue the testing program? What's, what's the status of that? I think Cindy uh, Curran, who was working with the Board of Health, uh, organizing all of that, I, I was not a part of that at all. We just volunteered the nurses to help out with the process. So I don't know if Cindy's on here right now. She would be the best person to answer, or perhaps Dr. Bodie. I see her. Um, I, yeah. I see, is she still here? Um, there's going to be an announcement about that very soon. Um, one of the things that's happened in the state in the last really week or two is that they've opened up more sites free, for free COVID testing. And um, I think that that is a direction that we are going to be moving in. But if you could wait a little bit on, on this information. Okay, I mean, that would be very disappointing. I mean, I know we're not paying for it and it's, it's a huge cost, but uh, I also know a lot of people who have done those tests and you know, the minimum drives at least a half an hour away, um, waiting for it to get done. I mean, people aren't, the teachers aren't gonna do it. So um, I, I would strongly discourage that. Um, and to the extent, you know, we need to chip in money, um, we can look at that, I, I don't know what, what the, what the well, deciding factor is. Yeah. Um, may, I, may I also just say that here we had it in our schools. We didn't even have people go to a location in Arlington. We had only half of our staff and teachers take advantage of it. Can I, can I add just something? I'm not gonna speak to the testing unless you wanna um, ask about the kind of the logistics of those days, but um, I do want to say that the stop the spread sites, while they're not right next door, they're all incredibly accessible. Um, very easy. I've been to two different ones. Um, I took my daughter to a third. Um, they really were very accessible and very easy to go through. And they're all the PCR, um, which is really the gold standard of what um, we want to see when, when people are being tested. And the results in each case for us was 24 hours. Um, so I, I did, I just wanted to add that. I understand that it's not as convenient as walking downstairs to the lobby, but the Stop the Spread sites are very accessible um, and have been extended. We thought that they were gonna end, um, first they were gonna end at the end of August and then the middle of September, but, but they're still up and running. So I, I just <clears throat> wanted to share that. And I, I, I do work as a broad provider in some of at one of their testing sites. Um, that's a lot of upfront work. I, it, you know, we don't have the bandwidth to sort of start that program, get a contract with them, 
Uh, it's incredibly cheap because of their large grants. I mean, certainly from an economics perspective, it's wonderful. But it's the, the front loading part of getting that up and running is huge. And then you, you sign on for a, a specific number of people and whether those people show up or not, you still continue to pay for them throughout an allotted period of time. So um, that's PCR, it's wonderful. It, it's, it's not invasive. It's not the nasopharyngeal, it's just the nasal. Um, that's, that's the broad with uh, MIT and Harvard. So, but that's a lot of front, front loading work. Just an FYI, it's, if, we had, if we had the personnel to start that program, I think it would be wonderful, but I, I just don't think we have that capa the capacity to do that. So I just wanted to add that. Ms. Keys, and or, or Mr. Cardin, are you done or no? No, I mean, I, I don't think anybody was suggesting a stop the spread site, but I, my understanding was the Armstrong Ambulance Program, which is also with the Broad Institute and also PCR, I believe, um, was going to continue and it'd be very disappointing if it stopped. That's, that's all I have to say. Uh, Ms. Keys? Um, I'm only learning about this in the past 24 hours. We were under the understanding that there was going to be ongoing testing available for teachers in Arlington a couple days a week for free, convenient sign up. I mean, I'm considering that like that was a verbal agreement that we had going forward. And it was part of the expectations of our staff members coming back into schools. If that's not going to be the case, we have a major issue. We have COVID in our schools. We have had our staff members' lives put at risk this week and our children's lives put at risk this week. This, this is not okay. And continuing to keep the schools open without having testing available and telling people, people don't have cars and they have to get to these testing sites. Some of these places have two and three hour waits. I'm glad Cindy was able to go and had a short wait, but that's not been the experience of many people I know. A lot of them are only open during school hours, which limits the availability of places you can go to. This is, this is not what was promised to us in the reopening plan. And our staff is shook right now because they've been put at risk already going back to school here. And we wanna be back and we wanna be with the kids and we are so happy, but having this rug yanked out from under us is not okay. And I know it's not the schools. I know it's the Board of Health that made this change, but I think we need to be working with them to get the testing plan back because our staff is not comfortable being in the schools without the testing plan, especially after two positives this week. Uh, Mr. Cardin. Uh, so based on that, I think it's appropriate to make a motion. Um, I move that the Arlington School Committee strongly re recommends that the town use all possible measures to continue the testing program, the COVID testing program. Second. Discussion? Um, Mr. Schiffman? Yeah, thank you. I'm shaky about being open without the test, or with the testing, because uh, testing is a, a, is a trailing indicator and we could have something going on in the building for a couple of days before we even uh, know about it to not have the testing readily available that people can get to quickly, I think is a huge problem. I will support Mr. Cardin's motion. Ms. Exton. Um, yeah, part of our August 10th um, reopening motion was to have a plan um, for testing for teachers. And part of that plan was that this was gonna be an ongoing um, testing for teachers on Tuesdays and Thursdays, Armstrong Ambulance this fall. Um, you know, as a teacher in a district that's not providing testing, um, I, I'm uncomfortable um, that we're not being provided testing. I think it was terrific that Arlington was providing testing for teachers. And so I will also be supporting this motion. Mr. Thielman. Yeah, I'm gonna support the motion. I'm. I'm unclear as to where the uh, bottleneck is. And can, it, is the bottleneck us? Is the, who, who, is the bottleneck the school department? Where is the bottleneck in not uh, making this possible to happen? I don't know who wants oh. I, This is the first I've heard of this like five minutes ago. So um, well, Dr. Bodie, do you want to take that one? 
Uh, you're bringing up questions that I wasn't really prepared to answer tonight because this is very recent and I would prefer to um, to answer that question at a later time. Okay, that's fine. I just, uh, it's, this is all new. <laughs> uh, be good to know where, where the bottleneck is, be good to really understand it, uh, but I'm gonna support Dr. Cardin's motion. Mr. Cardin's motion. Mr. Hainer. Um, I'm fine, thank you. All right, and I, um, hey, hey, what about me? Sorry, go ahead, Dr. Allison Ampey. Okay, I've had my hand up for a while before the motion, but I enthusiastically support Mr. Cardin's motion. I was really unhappy to hear what we're hearing tonight. It is not how it was described in August. It is not what we expected. It is not how the information that we had anticipated when we made our decisions. Um, I don't understand what the problem is. If it's money, then tell us how much and, and what needs to happen. If it's staffing, tell us how much and what needs to happen. Um, but I think I'm really frustrated by this. Uh, and you know, yes, in the best picture, the state would be doing all of this stuff, but clearly they're not pulling their weight. So at least we can take care of our town. So that's all. Mr. Hainer. Uh, whether there's a bottleneck or not, uh, I'd ask Dr. Bodie to find out as soon as possible what is going on and going on with what Dr. Ampey just said, we're here to support whatever it takes to, to get this program going on a regular basis. All right, anybody else? So my, my comments are just that I think that this is really extremely important. Um, it was absolutely part of the understanding that I think most of us had when we went down this path, that this was a, an enormous priority. And while I am, I am, I do think, you know, for the hundred and hundred now people watching, the Stop the Spread sites are fantastic. We went, I went this week, we had results in 12 hours. It was very easy. So everybody, parents, kids, for sure, go get tested, you stop the spread. We're so lucky to have it. But for our teachers, what we had agreed to do was to provide them testing in Arlington two days a week by appointment. Um, and, and, and that's what we said we were gonna do. And I feel very strongly that we need to make good on that promise. So I will be supporting Mr. Cardin's motion as well. Um, so unless anybody else has any more comments, seeing none, um, let's vote on this. So uh, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. So I hope that we can get, um, obviously need a lot more information about this um, and uh, so we'll um, certainly be, be following up. All right. Um, are, is there any more on the health metrics and learning model transitions? I see Mr. Thielman, because I want to, I do want to get to the special ed opening. So I see Mr. Thielman and Mr. Schlickman. Mm -hmm. So Mr. Thielman. Uh, I'm hoping this is within the scope of this. If not, my apologies, Dr. Frankie. Um, when it, this has come to me, um, if when the students do the uh, checklist in the morning and the parents do the checklist in the morning for their students and they have a fever over 100 degrees or a new cough, could you clarify for the public what they are supposed to do in terms of, um, I know they stay home that day. I understand they stay home that day, but what are they supposed to do? Either you or Ms. Sheridan, are they, or, or and, and do they have to get a COVID test? Can you clarify for the public uh, that and, and, do they have to stay home for 10 days? What is what 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 happens if you have a symptom, your child has a fever? Mm -hmm. What's the protocol? They, that's sure. the question. I hope it's within the scope. If not, please answer. Of not what? Uh, that, that's my question. That's my question. Okay. So there's a couple of different scenarios and they're all laid out. And there's even a graph mm -hmm. in the um, that we uh, utilized with the Cambridge Board of Health. And then Julie and Cindy also um, added to it. So, um, Child is sick, has 
has those symptoms and the symptoms are very specifically laid out. And I'm not, I don't want to be too pedantic on getting into every single one of them. Let's, let's stick to the general COVID symptoms, for example, fever and cough. Let's just say that's what the child has. Okay. It says contact your school nurse and or principal, contact your medical provider. You have to be out of school. At that point, there's, a, there's an algorithm of three different things that they can do. They can either keep the child out for an allotted period of time. I believe it's 10 days once if they're symptomatic. The middle uh, suggestion is, is that they go to their primary care provider be because there could be a secondary diagnosis, right? And we really hope, we have to hope that the PCP primary care provider tests that child or sends the child for a test. So then there's a diagnosis made at that level. Well, the other thing they can do is just go and get tested. Um, and could come back with resolution of symptoms for 24 hours and a negative test, a negative PCR test. Mm -hmm. We don't accept the antigen tests right now. So, so it is very clearly laid out. There's three different things that parents can do. I mean, some parents will say, I don't want to take my child for a test. That's their prerogative, but then the child can't come back to school. Thank you. Thank you for clarifying that. That's all I have. Thank you. All right, Mr. Schlickman, did you have a question or a comment? I do have a comment in that uh, way back in March when we were shutting down, I was impressed by the uh, the speed that uh, Arlington worked together with the health folks to make a determination and get things shut down before the governor decided that maybe we have a problem. Uh, at some point in the future when everybody's breathing again and, and can be reflective uh, I would like it to be able to have a conversation about exactly how this unfolded, in, as long as it's in a way that isn't uh, jeopardizing anybody's HIPAA rights, because I think that this, this is a, a tale of something well done, and I think that uh, the community would be well served to hear about that part of our history. Absolutely. I, I, and that and the fact that there is going to be an amazing amount of research uh, coming out of this. And I don't mean just medical research, but sociological research as well as a result of this. So it's, it's an excellent point. Um, and I'm, I'm really interested in reading it when it's done. Hopefully we'll get there sooner than later. All right. Anybody else? Okay, um, special education reopening update, um, Dr. McNeil and Ms. Elmer. Or um, who wants I'll to start. start? Are you gonna start? Okay. Yeah. And um, I'll start with the preschool because uh, Mr. Schlickman asked about that. So uh, for those who aren't aware, the Monotomy Preschool is part of the high school rebuild. Um, moved over to the Parmenter building. Um, and to answer your question, yes, we opened on time. Um, through extraordinary efforts of the facilities department, as well as the um, teaching staff <laughs> over at Monotomy. Um, they were working without internet up until the Friday before we opened. Um, and so they were setting up classrooms, still trying to attend all of our district PD. Um, I know facilities had people in over the weekend to ensure that, but we were able to have the building open, elevator, I wrote it on Tuesday, um, is, is functioning and is um, required for the students that we currently have. So um, we're glad that that is, um, was ready to go as we were going to have to do some reassignment of spaces if it weren't. Um, and yeah, so the program um, opened on Monday. They had families come in for small visits on Thursday and Friday so that they and the students could see the room. Um, I observed drop off the other day because I know there have been some concerns, um, you know, just with traffic in the area and, you know, they have a rolling drop off off up front and it, it, it went, you know, smoothly, um, you know, and that was on the second day. So um, things are going well over there and we have um, one of those classrooms are currently remote because of the options that uh, families have chosen. So. Um, but everyone else is in person over there. Um, as you heard um, at the beginning, um, this weekend with the remote academy at the elementary level, um, we had to 
um, make administrative changes to the general ed classroom assignments for uh, some students. This was unfortunate. It was not okay that, you know, as schedules finalized from general education and special educators were given it to, to start building their schedules that um, we could not service students spread across 36 classrooms in a remote academy. And um, of the 113 students who have IEPs in the remote academy, 19 families were contacted by administrators over the weekend to explain the classroom move and um, understandably very upset. Um, I think no one wanted to make that call. Um, there's not an excuse for having to make it. We're, we're at the situation we're at and we apologize. It's unsettling, it's disruptive, it was stressful. Um, ultimately, 11 families out of those 19 accepted the um, general ed classroom move and eight declined the classroom move. Um, and so there was a mention of having to waive special ed services. Um, a general ed assignment is an administrative assignment um, for families who um, declined that uh, move. They understood that they were waiving inclusion services, um, that the services that they are eligible for and could be provided in the general ed classroom assignment that we made, um, they chose not to accept those services during the period of the remote academy. Um, as I've explained before, the IEP does not change during this pandemic um, in any of the models, but what we have is our special ed educational learning plan. And in that we note that during the period of this pandemic, the services in the B grid, which are the push in or inclusion services are being declined. The other services pull out consultation, all those services remain in place. Um, and we apologize. I know I personally made phone calls. Um, the calls were made on Saturday. Um, if they were not able to reach someone, they left a message and followed up with an email. Um, I was speaking to people on Sunday as was Ms. Peretz, uh, Ms. Satsoulis, who are building administrators, along with our special ed coordinators, Ms. Prevost and Ms. Burke, who made the phone calls on Saturday. Um, and that that's the update of where we are with that. The other um, thing that we had to do for the remote academy is open an SLC class, a substantially separate classroom. Um, and so that was a new teacher hire. Um, it's a teacher who has been working in Woburn in a similar program, um, and we were able to finalize her hire on Friday. Um, as I've explained throughout the process, our substantially separate or SLC classroom supported learning centers are very small cohorts. In some cases, there's only five students, but we've had situations where three opted to be remote and two remained in person. Um, as you build the general ed schedule, because Almost all of these students participate in general education as well. Um, mirroring a building schedule, an in-person schedule with the remote academy schedule um, makes it impossible for that teacher to work in both the building and work um, in the remote setting. So we had to hire a additional teacher for that program. And so um, three families were notified that the um, teacher they thought they were having from in-person was not gonna be able to do both in-person and remote. Dr. McNeil, did you want to speak or did you want to ask questions now? Uh, we can field questions and then we can uh, respond to those questions. I, I, I do want to say one thing. This is not just a special education uh, uh, issue. Uh, this is something that we collectively, when we uh, venture to start placing students into the Remote by Choice Academy, this is something where we should have started with the students who have an IEP and under, understand the services and the impact on staffing. That's where we should have started and then built the, and then place the other students so that we would make sure that we identify what was needed with them first. And so then we could follow up and make sure that the kids were not um, spread out so thin over the district. So I just wanna make sure that this is not just a special education, um, uh, practice. This is something that we as all of our administrators, as we start to think about placing students in classes, this is something that we should have uh, definitely discussed before we started, we finalized anybody's schedule. Um, okay, so um, I, I'm going to imagine that every, almost everybody has questions or comments on this one. So Ms. Exton. Um, sure, thank you. So 
my first question, and I, I totally recognize that each case is in individual, and so I'm hoping this can be sort of answered broadly. Um, just thinking about the questions about students who are coming four days, and is it, um, I guess, sort of what are the, what's the big picture thought around what that's supposed to look like for students who are coming four days? Are they in the general ed classroom? You know, there's this concern of they're going to get the same thing twice versus some specialized instruction on the other two days. Can you share just a little bit in a sure. in so? Um, Madam Pierre Pac Maxwell spoke about this. Um, I don't know if Mr. Maringer is going to speak about this as well, but it is to your point, it is individual. So I, I will speak broadly. The intention is, and we've, we've spoken of in the past, that the students who are coming in for four days, there may be students for whom that repetition and the opportunity for preview and review and practice is valuable and staying in that general ed classroom is what's required for them. Um, there are other students for whom it's really the support that they need to do their work um, from a special educator that they're coming in that second day and they might be doing more of their asynchronous work. Um, in any classroom, you know, situation, and I think Gibbs and Audison have um, handled this differently, which is why you're hearing different things. Um, so I'm glad we have both of um, Mr. Maringer and Ms. Pierre, or Madam Pierre Maxwell here. Um, is that even in a, in a general ed classroom, right, a teacher doesn't speak for 40 minutes straight, right? You know, they begin with a mini lesson and then students break up into groups. So even within those groups, there's, you know, we're not talking about having to necessarily leave the classroom, even if you're working in a small group over here on, or within smaller groups. I know we're obviously not close like we used to be physically, but you know, some kids may be working on, on one thing while another group is working on, I think that's just common practice, right? That That's how we, you know, design our instruction in, in workshop models. So all of those things can happen. So there isn't one set way of doing it. Um, I think probably in hearing us talk about it, some people really liked what they heard, uh, you know, of that possibility and other people you know, liked the other possibility. Um, I've, I've received feedback about folks who did not want their child to leave the general ed room and folks who did not want their child in the general ed room. So it really is individual. So can I uh, have Ms. Peretz and Mr. Maringer and um, Madame Pierre Maxwell, if you would like to add anything, I'm gonna give you an opportunity to do so now. Yes, thank you. Um, I think it is really important to remember that this was, uh, these were decisions made that were about individual student needs. And so that the way that we approach it is going to be very different depending on the student and those needs. And, it's, and, and for those four day students, there were different kinds of classifications of kids, just not to get too much into it, but another category could be that we're talking about English language learners and we're talking about other students who have other reasons to be present. Um, and they were wide and varied. So the ways in which we meet those needs um, and make sure that every piece of that plan is put in place is going to take a little bit of time as we go through the process of, of um, you know, coming back into the school session. Across the elementary schools, we've added this extra piece of trying to make sure that across all of our elementary schools, the experiences are also the same. So that that's going to take some time to develop that as well. And so the specific questions of the specific plans are hard to answer at this point, um, but we are working very closely with families to make sure that we are making that experience as, as positive and as productive and as um, you know, considering social emotional needs and the whole student um, as we do that work. Thank you, Mr. Maringer. Sure, so um, obviously the first week is a lot different. There aren't a lot, it's a lot of meeting and greeting and you've been out for six months. So, um, you know, obviously this week is gonna be a lot different than the rest of the year. But for most of the students that we have, they have two days of live classes and they have Wednesday where they meet 
synchronously online. And then they have two asynchronous lessons. And I think for the kids that we've identified as high needs or moderate needs, it's really those two asynchronous days that many of the kids struggled with either executive functioning or knowing what to do and needed some help. So I think the model that we're really looking at is, yes, they can go back for the same lesson, if that makes sense. But we're also trying to provide a place for them to get very individualized services with either a paraprofessional or, depending if you're in co-teaching, with a special education teacher to help those students in very small groups be able to work their way through the asynchronous days. And I think as we get up and running and we start moving into that, I think the benefit for many of our kids is going to be able to be in school and really getting help on assignments instead of being at home where maybe an parent doesn't know what the lesson is, what the, objections, the objectives are, how to help, how to organize, how to get on the Google Classroom, all those different links I think that's really why we wanted to see many of our moderate and high needs kids in the school. And I think that what we're really providing for those kids is really small classes, sometimes three, four kids with just one adult working them through the work that they need to do. And so I actually think it's going to be a great you know, advantage to those kids to really be able to be in school and be able to get lessons. And if they have questions, have teachers down the hall. So that's what I'm kind of envisioning is what is going to happen throughout the year. However, in not being in school for, you know, since March, I think many of these kids and many of what we're trying to do with teachers is just introduction, build them up, getting back into routine. So I don't see the first I see the first couple weeks establishing a rhythm. And I think once we get into the rhythm of the school year, I think it will be beneficial for these students. I had one thing to that too, which is that in those small groups um, and thinking about, because the class itself is much smaller, right? In the hybrid model as, as we're all back together. And there's also this other element of the fact that like Mr. Marringer just said, the children have been out of school for a long time and have, very, have had uh, varying levels of success with um, continuing on with their educations. And so the teachers are working to really differentiate or will be, right now they're building relationships, they're getting to know people, but as they're informally assessing and then more formally assessing a little bit more down the road, you know, that instruction that's happening in the classroom is going to have to be differentiated. It's going to be really targeting individual needs for all of our students. So. The idea that, like I can see how people have it in their head now that on those second days, the experience will be exactly the same. Like yes, on the surface, maybe it seems like the experience will be exactly the same, but it's actually going to be so differentiated for most of our students that it will be different depending on the ways in which they need to uh, have that curriculum presented to them and working with their teachers on that on that curriculum. So I just don't think it's going to be the same all the time and it will be different for different kids. And, right. Kate, and I, sorry to interrupt. I just think it's also very different from the elementary and the middle school. So in the elementary school where you're with one specific teacher for more of the day, in the middle school you're you're going to five or six different classes with five or different five or different you know, six different teachers. And so I also think the model is going to look a little bit different where you might be getting tutored in another room and getting help with assignments in certain classes that you need help with. And it, it's not going to necessarily look because the setup of a middle school compared to an elementary school is different. So I don't think the model will look exactly the same. The only thing I also want to add is that also one of the things we've talked about with um, having students come in for four days is if they were to only come in on the hybrid model and that's why we looked at moderate and high needs students not just the level four that the state required um one we know that the services are more accessible if they're in person but also the ability to schedule all of their services on two days only that they're in person with the state's goal to or priority to deliver in-person service would students wouldn't then be able to both participate in their general ed classes if we were also trying to get 
you know, pull them for speech, pull them for OT, pull them for, you know, the reading or writing block that they were, they were going to receive as well. So this also allows for the delivery of those pullout services as well. And so that they're able to, you know, they don't have to be pulled from content areas. Uh, Madam Pierre Maxwell, did you want to add anything? Sure. I mean, there isn't much more to add beside what my colleagues have just explained, except that it's a beautiful puzzle that we have all the pieces and it's taking time to put them just right on the board. And uh, just having the teachers collaborating with each other, as Mr. Marenger pointed out, the children have about five to seven different teachers, which is a different thing to adjust to from elementary to middle school. So we want all these different teachers to be collaborating and making sure that we're selecting the right time of the day uh, to make sure the children are receiving everything that they should be receiving on their schedule. So it's gonna take a minute, but I think once we have all the pieces in the right places, uh, the fact that we only have half of the children in the building, we really will be maximizing the time they have in front of the teachers for them to be able to go deeper in differentiating for them and presenting everything they need uh, in the school year. So I think it's taking us a little time to make all that happen, but we're on the right track. I think also many of our special educators have been in several conversations in per uh, via phone and on email with parents because some of our, uh, of our parents, um, they've been given the choice of having the four days and some of them want to have just two days and not have the children come for four days and not clear on, oh, what does that mean? Are they gonna be able to get this service and that service? So we are in conversation with our parents to explain to them, if your child has quota versus inclusion, this is how it differs. This is how, this is why it's most helpful to have them in the building all the four days. And if you pick just two days, which you may as a parent, then it may create some challenges because we want them to come in the A day so they can get all the information with their other classmates and then the special education liaison can pull them out to individualize for them. So there's a lot of pieces that we're still working with. We have all the pieces now. We just ask for the patients to really put them together in the right place. Uh, but I think we are on the right track. Thank you. You're welcome. Thanks. Um, thanks, Ms. Morgan Walton. Mr. Cardin. Uh, <clears throat> thank you. Um, so, I mean, I, I, I do think we need to take a look at how this error occurred. I, I mean, it's, it's, I, I'm grateful that everybody is acknowledging how significant it was um, and, and apologizing for it. For it. And, um, you know, Dr. McNeil suggesting how, how things should have been done. But I do think we need to explore a little bit about why that wasn't raised. I mean, either it was the coordinators were not at the table when the elementary principals were meeting and discussing this, or maybe there was some uh, thought that this could all be worked out, but nobody actually sat, sat down, to, nobody was assigned to sit down to do it, I don't know. But we, I, think, I do think we need to take a look um, at subcommittee about how this occurred so we can prevent it from occurring in the future. I mean, obviously it's a very special circumstance, but there have been other issues where, um, uh, special ed was not consulted in decisions and and we want to make sure that, that that doesn't occur again in the future um, as to this the other issue with the four day students you know I, I am very grateful that we're one of the few districts that is committing to bringing those those moderate need kids in more often that is a great thing that we've done um, and you know we're, we're we're having some some trouble with it as a result but a lot of the trouble is communication um, I mean I think there is confusion about what's supposed to happen on those two days. Um, and if there was more clear communication about this has to be worked out individually for the first couple of weeks, yeah, your student, you know, isn't it, it, the first couple of weeks isn't going to look like what it's going to look like for the rest of the year. Um, but this is what we're going to do for those first two weeks. Your student's going to be in the library with a teacher's aid. It's not always going to be a teacher's aid for the full year. Sometimes they're going to get a teacher, sometimes they're going to get go back in the classroom to go over difficult material. But I think uh, the communication piece was missing and a lot of parents were left confused and then angry when they weren't getting answers. So, um, uh, you know, again, as we, we sort of uh, 
get through this difficult period and look back, um, you know, I, I do think we need to look at our resources, particularly at the middle school level, um, to, to see whether we have enough team chairs and, and coordinators to support um, the very, very different things that are going on on there. Um, so that's all for me. Thanks. Um, Dr. Allison Ampey. Um, thank you. Um, I was going to say that I felt I, that Mr. that Dr. McNeil explained how the situation came, which was my original question. Um, but I do like Mr. Cardin's idea that we should take an take a look at how this error occurred and make sure that it doesn't happen again. Um, and I'd like I'd love to have hear more about it as a subcommittee. Um, in terms of actual questions, I know that there were a number of parents who were concerned that their student, while perhaps low needs um, last year, because of the six months off and, and the remote learning last year and, and everything, they're concerned that they're now moderate, or, you know, that their needs have increased. And I'm wondering when or if these kids will be able to start be being evaluated um, in case they do have greater needs now. So, so I think, you know, we've just highlighted that we've been in school for four days and the things that are working out. I, I think that all students, um, not just special ed students, uh, you know, we're off for six months and, and we're all using a process to assess students to see where they are while they're returning. That'll be taking place over the next um, few weeks. And that's that's a general ed practice that that'll be happening. Um, and so I do think it's important that students get acclimated and return to school um, and, and see how they respond to that return. The state has also identified that there are, you know, general ed recruitment um, uh, services that may be ne necessary for students who, who aren't eligible. Um, we've talked before and I've explained the compensatory service process um, that may be due to the closure and or the need for additional services for new disability the disability related concerns that have risen during the the closure so there, there's two mechanisms for that um but i i you know four days in I, I think we need to give students time to get back get you know into the schedule get the routines down um start actually teaching content and assessing where they are and then we can you know individually teams can always meet um, to consider that that's I mentioned at a previous meeting the need to have those um, discussions around compensatory services or additional services okay thank you mr. Thielman we've covered a lot of ground my you know I guess the only thing I would like is a frame of reference just of the of the students offered how many students were offered four days and how many took four days in person how many took uh went remote I, we'd have to get back to you with that data um okay. i don't have it readily at hand i mean each principal would have which students are you know that we calculated as who would be eligible for um four days um i don't think anyone has calculated who, who accepted who did not at this point um we can come back at that within i think that'd be good to have also did you have any um issues getting enough instructors for in person or remote uh, either one for the uh, across the district I think we have um, I think that right now every I mean I don't want to speak for all the administrators here but TAs are very difficult I'm talking about just special ed, just, just the high need students I'm talking about the high need students oh to have staff in the building for those coming in yeah no we're staff for students to come into the building yeah. but we still are looking for TAs um, yeah, I know that I know yeah. that. Yeah, I know that. Okay, thank you. Mr. Schlickman? Yeah, this, this seemed like a Judith Viorst kind of thing. It's a terrible, horrible, no good, very bad day and for those SPED families, and they're very upset, and I can't say that I blame them. On the other hand, this is something we've never done before, uh, and it's very difficult to do. Uh, I hope we learn from it in uh, that we know and have enough institutional knowledge going forward that we're going to be able to uh, prevent something like this from happening again in the future. Sure, and I, I think, you know, to answer the question, I think your 
all absolutely correct. That this highlights the need for universal design. Um, and now I know that sounds like ed speak, but you know, we the classroom assignments were built around homeschool affiliation, and that's and that's where they were built. And so that was done first. And then once the schedules were handed out, we were in a situation where you now have special ed kids from every school, and there's seven classrooms at a grade level, and they the driver for their assignment was their home school. Um, and so if we had built the schedule, as um, Dr. McNeil had said, around not just special ed students, EL students, students receiving RTI, if you build it from there, they're already included rather than building a schedule, handing it out, and then trying to fill in on the outside of it. So it, it is a very important lesson for all of us. And um, I look forward to working with you or if you want to talk about more about it in a subcommittee um, and with my colleagues on this. Yeah, it's, it's frustrating for me because I've scheduled school, I've scheduled districts, I've, I've done this work. And it's, it's a process of layering that you take the most difficult uh, components and lay them in first and then the easy ones you slosh around to, to fill. And uh, it doesn't sound like we did it that way. And, and, and that's really a core component. And if you're do, working in the high school and building a high school schedule, you're sort of hip to this. But if you're building an elementary schedule, you're generally doing this by hand, by instinct, by talking about kids, maybe using stickies or index cards. It, it's a whole different process. And uh, having to do the hybrid to remote to A uh, cohort to B cohort and layer in all the uh, IEPs in there is, is just too complicated for the way we normally do business. Right, and we usually do that at the building level, right? We, we, one building, so that happens. Now you combine seven buildings and that's where we're at. And I think it's important, if I may just jump in for a second, is that it is, so what Ms. Elmer is saying is really key part of this story, is that we heard loud and clear that families wanted to stay connected to their home schools. And so we were trying very hard to meet that need. We, in fact, also wanted that to happen. And so I think it's, there certainly are a lot of lessons to learn here. And I made some of those phone calls on Saturday and I, I really, really very much felt for the families and understood why that was so upsetting and was very sorry to have to do that but it is this story of what's happened throughout this pandemic is that we're trying to do things and trying to meet this need and then having information shift and change and having to adjust to it in order to do the best that we can. So while I do feel terrible that this happened, I know I do um, welcome the opportunity to process through it in a committee because I think I do understand how it happened. Um, and that we have become stronger through that, but that, that doesn't make it any easier for the people who had to have that happen to them. Um, so we do apologize for that, but I think it was, I think the intention was a good one at the beginning. And it was never, I would hate to think that it was because people felt that the needs of our students in special education and, and other students who are afforded services were not being considered throughout the process because they were very heavily considered all throughout the process. Thank you. Mr. Hainer. First off, I'd like to thank Dr. McNeil for his statement. I really appreciate it. I'm sorry it wasn't our approach at the beginning. Uh, this is the most vulnerable and fragile population that we deal with, these kids. Um, I'm happy also to hear what uh, Mr. Schlickman said about uh, doing this, to handling the most difficult part. Hindsight is wonderful. Uh, I look forward to the subcommittee and uh, straightening this out. I have a couple of questions. You indicated there were 19 parents that contacted you. 11 seemed you've worked something out. Without going into detail, what happens with the other eight? So no, we contacted 19 families. Just okay. We reached out to the 19 impacted out of the 113. Um, and so we spoke through it with them. And again, the services can be implemented in the general ed classroom if they're declining that service to remain in, 
in the gen ed classroom, they're declining it for the period of the remote academy. It doesn't change the IEP. They haven't given up or waived their right to that service. It's that while they're in the remote academy, in some cases that means that a student who had one 30 minute session of push and support over the week um, is, is not going to receive that, but is gonna receive their other pullout services. It was the B grid, those push in services. Um, we have spoken with the families um, in some cases, you know, they agreed that, you know, in a couple of weeks to see how it goes and we can reconvene as teams to look at, you know, without that service, is there perhaps another service that needs to be implemented in the C grid um, to, you know, make up for that or to help assist in that area. Um, and so those are decisions that teams will be making as they, the general ed teacher weighs in on how the student's doing, how the parent weighs in, how the special educator weighs in on how the student's doing. So just to be clear, all the IEPs and all the requirements in the IEP are going to be met? So, so no, they can be met by administratively reassigning their general ed classroom placement. If a, if a parent declined that, re, that administrative reassignment, so think about it, if we were, had a fourth grade, we had four fourth grade classes, and- I understand, I understand what you're saying. Yes, and uh, so on, we, but, we reassign them to but, other classrooms because we collapsed one. But they're saying in this instance, I don't want the reassignment. And so in doing so, they are waiving the push in services during the period of remote academy. If they want to come in person, we've, we've talked about that many of, um, you know, everyone has the option to switch from remote academy to in person, then their services would go back to what was in the IEP. The IEP hasn't changed. So just for clarification, if I had a student in a building at the Heidi school, and you weren't able to provide that service at the Heidi school. You could offer it in another school, and I, if I declined that, I would not, it would not be considered a, a violation of the IEP? So the general ed placement is an administrative assignment. It's not a special ed placement. Just like but, I explained with collapsing a class. Okay, okay. I, I understand that, but I mean, if, the, if you did not have a special education classroom in that, in, at Hardy, and, and we, oh, never mind. I'll, I'll talk to you privately on this. Thank you. I, I think because the virtual academy is, is not a brick and mortar building, I, I think that's probably where the parallel is breaking down. There, there is a classroom in which we could implement it virtually. But the, my, my understanding was that the DESI was not going to give you that option to decline, to tell the parent you have to go one way or the other, even in the virtual. Yeah, so maybe we need to talk it through. I All right, fine, thank you. Taking his head, I'm not. Thank you. Uh, I would like to also thank Ms. Elmer and the special education coordinators, and it was not an easy weekend. And I know that it's impactful on the families, but you know, despite the fact that it was a difficult decision to make, the decision was made and we followed through with it. And again, I apologize to the families that were impacted. I understand that it was, you know, very, disheartening to get that phone call over the weekend. And uh, we're gonna continue to try to support the families in any way that we know how. And um, so I, I do wanna thank the administrators, Ms. Elmer, the special education coordinators who reached out to families. And I know that they had to engage in those difficult phone calls. So thank you very much. Um, so my comments, I echo what Dr. McNeil said. I also wanna thank our um, our teachers, especially at the elementary level, who got new kids in their classes on Saturday and Sunday, because um, that's always um, before you're starting remotely on Monday. Um, so, you know, I think for me, where I'm disappointed with this is that, again, you know, I guess it, I never thought that it needed to be said. In my mind, I always thought, well, of course we're gonna schedule our high needs kids first. Like that's the, that's the first thing that we do. And I understand that that was done to a certain extent and because we drilled down and, and the placements were made by the teachers who know these kids the best, right? They were, they were mostly, the classes were developed to some extent and mostly by the teachers who had the kids, you know, for most of last year. But um, I think that, you know, it's so important. And I think that we have an opportunity right now um, 
as as a as a as a broader district and as a community to really um, become a place where we um, we prioritize special education um, in a way that we maybe never have before because I think this is a time when the community you know it, it was laid bare in the spring how some of these kids just couldn't couldn't manage remote learning couldn't do it with respect to like you know this without the supports that they had um and and how um disproportionate the impact of having our schools closed was on certain vulnerable populations and i think we're at a place right now where before maybe we didn't want to say oh well you know our biggest priority is to make sure we get our placement for our slc students correct right and 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 maybe we didn't say those kind of things and i do think that we're in a place now where we can say that to the broader community and i think that there will be more understanding and engagement around um around having that really be how we as a district um work with our with our highest needs um, populations, because I do think there's much broader understanding about, you know, the impacts around school for these kids and, and how challenging the work is that their educators do and that their needs need to be, um, to be really prioritized. Um, so I, you know, I know that all of our principals are working very hard to um, get the staffing in place that we need to um, successfully run this schedule and do these programs. Um, and I'm, I'm glad that we're continuing to work on that. Um, and um, so anyway, that's, that's all that I have on that. Um, May I add one thing? Yes. Uh, excuse me, I'm sorry. I, I wanna make sure though that people understand that our placement does always start there. I can, always, I can only speak for the elementary level but we always start with those students who need that consideration first for whatever reason that is. And so in the spring, we did our placements based on that for classrooms that would be in person. Um, we worked with our teachers, we did that collaboratively, we did it based on data and from the experiences that the teachers had had with the students, remote learning through the time of closure um, included. And then, but, you have to realize what happened when people made that choice to go to the remote academy, which was fine. I mean, that was the choice and we very much supported people in having that choice, obviously, when we created that plan, is then what we had left were lists that then needed to be reassigned because there was not an ability to anticipate who was going to make that choice and, and decide to go to that remote academy. So then it went from there. Um, and what I've spoken to before. But I wanna make sure people understand that that is our process and that we will continue to focus on making sure that that is what we lead with is through that lens of, of equity and inclusion and supporting all of our learners as best we can. Thank you. Uh, I just wanna add a comment that uh, I don't want anybody to leave this thinking that uh, our most vulnerable students in terms of learning was an afterthought. That was not the case at all. To some extent, it was very fluid during this time. It's been amazing how many people keep wanting to change between the two programs. And could we, could we do the services within a school? As it turns out, we will be doing um, all of the services within a school. So, Starting at the school was not necessarily the wrong way to start. I think one of our, I think we were pushing to get the assignments out too quickly. Um, and perhaps if it wouldn't have been so um, hurtful, perhaps is the word, is that you get assigned a teacher and then later on you get assigned a different teacher as we try to consolidate how we're going to support the, the students that honestly it was changing all the time so um i will say the other good news i think is that we have outstanding teachers teaching the remote academy we have excellent teachers and who have uh, been supporting special education students in their own classes over the years and regardless we'll be doing the same thing this year so um 
a lot of attention has been given to this. It's just, I think, by moving in too quickly, and uh, the assignments became more became noticed. What happens is that sometimes you can just wait and and do all the tinkering later before you actually say who's in which teacher's class, and you probably just got out too far in front of it. Mr. Cardin. So I wish we had stopped before those comments. I mean, I think what happened is kids were reassigned from their home school. That's partly why they're so upset. In the remote academy, for example, there's a Dallin fifth grade or whatever. Maybe it's shared with bracket. I don't know all the details. But because we can't offer it, we cannot offer inclusion support in that class, that student was told after they've already met their classmates, so they had to go to a class, a different remote academy class which didn't have students from their school in it. So by building, like, like, doc, like Ms. Elmer said, by building the assignments around home school, we created this issue where these kids with IEPs are the only ones in a class without kids from their home school. And, and I understand the tension there, and that was something that perhaps should have been discussed more fully, that those two things couldn't happen without, without suddenly increasing staff you know, by two or three additional special ed teachers. Um, and, and we didn't hear that, nobody raised that. And, and so that's the problem is that this, this trade-off, either scrambling kids across the remote academy or being fair to special needs kids wasn't, wasn't, wasn't discussed. It wasn't raised by anyone. So we need to look at this more in, in in uh, a subcommittee to get to get a better handle on how this happened, but, I, but I, I do regret the comments sort of downplaying that this was just a, a scrambling that always happens because these so, kids are, are, are being sent to a different school basically. There were ki many kids sent to different schools. We tried to balance. I don't want to imply that at all. Uh, they were very much um, front and center in terms of discussion and as some people mentioned we really tried to focus as much as possible on having students stay in the school. Uh, we, we know that was something that parents and uh, our students valued. And we regret this has happened. Uh, we're going to learn from it. Um, I think we can discuss it more in a subcommittee meeting um, for sure. Um, but uh, I, I really want people to leave this conversation thinking that our educators were not concerned about the education of our most vulnerable students. But that's not the case. I don't think it's the case. Okay. Um, any other comments? Mr. Schlickman? One quick last comment, and this is coming from a dissenting viewpoint, and I don't want to get into the I told you so, but this is the reason why we should have opened up all remote and gradually brought people in rather than trying to go and do everything all at once, because we're seeing problems based on trying to go too fast with a very, very difficult model. Yeah, and I, I just want to explain to Mr. Cardin's point, I think the reality of what if we did use universal design would have meant that homeschool affiliation wasn't the driver that classrooms would have been created so that general ed and special ed students from various homeschools were mixed what what and that so classrooms are built just like they are in a school building you look at the composition of the classroom you look where you can concentrate resources and that would have meant that that the entire community would not have gotten that homeschool affiliation classes may have been combined from three or four schools because we were building around that group those those to your point um Ms. morgan are, are those decisions we as a community want to make and, and like i said I, I welcome that discussion at, at a subcommittee um, because it, it, it would have far-reaching impacts outside of special ed if we operated as a whole from that premise mr hainer i think the biggest part of this is the timing and we've all, it's, everybody's acknowledged this and, and whether universal planning or whatever, we knew that we were not going to be in the same situation this September as we have in the past. And we had to look at it bigger. 
I think the parents, you're not going to please everybody all the time. But to call people up on the weekend before the day before school starts is, is you just we're just asking for it. And I think that's the biggest part. No matter what we would have decided, it's the timing. We realize that and we regret that it happened. And all I can say is that we will learn from it. And um, hopefully we do not have to have a similar situation in the future. I, I just got to say that intentional or not, the special ed population in this town feels like feels that it is the last or the ending thought. Real or not, it's a perception and we have to accept these perceptions. Ms. Keys. I just want to say, please listen to your teachers because we have been saying since mid-August that this was these plans didn't work. Specifically, there's not enough hours in the day to, to do the special ed services the way they're being scheduled. And when you sit here and say, why didn't we know about this ahead of time? I told you, like I said it at a meeting, it was in a written document, I said it to you ahead of time. Like if we need to listen to our staff that's on the ground and then we won't have these changes being made at the last minute. And I know that we're trying and I know that doing everything on Zoom is a lot harder than being in person when we can walk around, but like the messages aren't getting up. Like there's, there's, there's broken communication somewhere because our teachers have been saying this for weeks that the schedules they were given, the kids, the services weren't gonna work. All right, any other comments, questions? Okay, um, so the next item is the first read of revisions to the 2020-2021 school calendar. I just wanna be clear, cause I got a number of questions from people, I guess they saw this on the agenda and they thought that maybe the whole calendar was changing again. Um, it's not, I believe, and Dr. McNeil can speak to this, that we're mostly discussing just the additions of um, conferences, which is gonna shrink some of our days. Um, so anyway, Dr. McNeil. Yes, thank you. So uh, you're right. It does not, it's not changing the calendar as a whole. Uh, we're just looking at the early release Tuesdays that were um, originally scheduled you know, pre-pandemic, um, and then we had to move those particular days to Wednesday, and then we had to add the high school and the middle school to that because they were not originally scheduled to have early release every week. And then, yes, some of those uh, conferences were scheduled on those early release days, so we had to move those as well. I do want to point out a clerical error that I just noticed before our meeting today is I'm looking at the um, Wednesday before uh, the winter break and on the 23rd, December 23rd, where it, it's, if you look at the calendar, it has the um, conferences scheduled for elementary. And I want to uh, take a moment and speak with Dr. Bodie. Like we wanna convene on that and move those conferences to another date. So I just want to point that out. Everything else looks uh, correct, though. So this is a first read. So mm -hmm. um, that's good because <laughs> we're <laughs> going to bring it back and do a second right. read, and right. then we can, right. if you can do that communication uh, between now and then, that would be super. And then that will spare uh, Miss Fitzgerald from um, doing an. Uh, in line edit right now. Right. So, um, any uh, discussion around the first read of the calendar? All right. Seeing uh, Ms. Exton. All right. Um, I also just so there's this other PD day that. Um, will need to be scheduled. And again, I know scheduling is crazy right now anyway, but just again, wanting to give parents a heads up about when um, that will be scheduled. Do you, Dr. Bird, do you have thoughts? Which, are you holding which, which, which PD day are you uh, referring um, to? So it says teachers only, and then it says September 2nd and November 3rd, those are scheduled. And then there's one more 
to be scheduled, mm -hmm. right? No, that would be November 3rd would be our, our nor that's that, uh, uh, that day has not changed. Uh, so we usually, that's, a, I believe that's election day. Right. And, and then we didn't, have, I thought you held uh, the 3rd of September. We held the second day back. Right. It came on Wednesday. We didn't have in service on Thursday. So we still have a day, a PD that's day. It. Yeah, we banked, we banked that bank, day. Yeah. Right, we banked that day. Um, I, I, I hear what you're saying now. So September 3rd, we banked that day. And, you know, I don't, I, I'm going to yield that, like you said, back to Dr. Bodhi to discuss that banking of the day. But I just want to be clear that November 3rd has not been changed from right. the original calendar. We have one day that's a teacher day that's banked. And right now on this calendar, we have it as following the last day of school. If for some reason this year we needed to have uh, a transition day, um, who knows what's gonna happen with this pandemic. We would move that teacher day um, forward and that would affect the last day of school. It would be pushing it out one day. So I have a comment about that. So what you're saying is, is that assuming that we carry on with the AABB all year and we get to the last day of school that the Monday that are assuming there's no snow days and I'm not getting into snow days, but then we're at that Tuesday, which would be the last day of school would be a teacher PD day instead of an A day. No. Um, no, as the calendar is, is right here, oh, as the calendar is, the last day is, um, I need a little bit bigger, uh, different glasses for this one, um, it's June 22nd. It stays June 22nd unless we have snow days, which we have to talk about later or we would take the day that we did not have for teachers in August and insert it somewhere during the year, which you would be consulted about. Um, but right now with no snow days and no usage of that teacher day, the last day is June 22nd. Okay. All right. Any other questions about the calendar? So the one other thing that I wanted to bring up without expectation of a response or solution tonight was just looking at the number of um, AA versus BB days because we have three holidays, um, Yom Kippur on Monday, uh, Indigenous Peoples Day in mid-October, and then Election Day on November 3rd. So those are three days that we um, don't have school for, uh, in-person in school for A students, um, B students will still have two days that week. Um, so we just want to keep um, not looking for a change in the next six weeks, obviously, or anything, but just um, keep in mind that, you know, there is, hopefully we can come to a place where there's some more equality between the number of in-person days between both of those models. Um, so anyway, that's, that's for another day. Um, okay, so Dr. McNeil, you'll make that revision with Ms. Fitzgerald, and then we'll come back to approve this at yes, our next and I, and I also look at what you just commented on as well. Brilliant. Thank you. Um, staff hiring, Mr. Spiegel. Okay, I'm going to uh, hope to be quick through this. I'm going to share my screen in a brief uh, presentation. Um, so I will, oops. So this is just uh, you know the brief staffing update that I do every September. 
Um, so just to highlight, we have several new administrators. So you've met uh, our new Gibbs principal, Madam Pierre Maxwell, our new Pierce principal, Mr. Amadi, new Audison assistant principal, Julia McEwen, um, a new elementary special education coordinator, Sophie Prevost. And we, as we talked, Dr. Bodhi talked about the acting um, remote academy administrators at the elementary level. Um, so uh, we've already talked about that. Um, for the new teachers so far, in terms of who we've hired new to the, to the unit A, AEA, um, 55 new educators, including teachers, team chairs, and specialists. We have we didn't have a, ton, a lot of retirements this past year, but we have three who were replacing uh, educators who retired, uh, 15.5 replacing educators who resigned, uh, four replacing educators who moved to a different transfer to a different position in the district, 13.5 replaced educators on a leave of absence, and then 19 so far our new positions in the budget are added because of the needs of this year in, in this um, category. Um, you've asked in the past for the reasons for resignations, and I have been doing exit interviews. I've, the, the way I've been doing exit interviews this year um, primarily has been through uh, a Google form uh, with the question so that the uh, educators who have resigned um, are sent that and um, they're invited to respond. You know, it, it, a lot, there's several moving away from the area, a uh, few cited commuting time, and one uh, Teacher specifically cited the change in the school start times as a factor that related to the commuting time. Um, other professional career moves within education, some for increased compensation from other districts, some are pursuing graduate school, and some for other personal reasons uh, not to, to teach right now. Um, there's a mix uh, through the different schools. Uh, Gibbs and Audison had several new teachers this year. Uh, you know, they both Gibbs and Audison added a learning community. Um, so, you know, that's four new teachers there plus special educator. So we had, um, we definitely have more new teachers at those schools. Uh, paraprofessionals, um, this has been brought up tonight that, you know, we need teaching assistants and building substitutes. Uh, we've hired so far 39. Uh, we still have many more to fill. We, we had several resignations in August and even in the past couple of weeks of paraprofessionals. Um, and the reason um, I think that they're resigning at this time of year is because other districts are looking for teachers and many of them have become licensed and uh, have been able to secure teacher positions in other districts. Um, and we're still, as, as I said, we're still looking to staff these positions I've posted in multiple places. Um, and it's, it's challenging. I think a lot of districts are looking for paraprofessionals right now. Um, the process this year, um, you know, in past years, I've met with every new hire in person in my office. This year, I met with everyone remotely. Um, we also implemented a system, thanks to Mr. Mason, um, to um, do, um, all of the new hire paperwork online through DocuSign. Um, still doing obviously queries and fingerprinting and everything. I wanna um, you know, especially mention our IT department and central office. The IT department especially, they distributed new devices to all the teachers in the district, um, got a new laptop, and all the new educators coming in had to get um, new devices. Um, and new accounts in the district, email and Google accounts and everything so they could be set up. So the IT department has been working very hard um, to get all that work done. Um, you know, we're still uh, continuing the mentor and induction process. We had our new teacher training and orientation all virtually this year for the first time. And I wanna thank all of the presenters, all of the mentors, all of the curriculum directors who presented and, and adjusted what they usually do to do it all um, virtually, and especially Marie Janiak, our new teacher and mentoring coordinator. And, and um, I, I also want to mention, um, you know, we are still adding staff. Um, we have a few teacher hires to make. We're still looking for a couple of positions in special ed and reading, and we're still looking for paraprofessionals. 
Um, we've also adjusted a lot of, I can stop the sharing, but we, um, we adjusted FTEs of several, um, some of our teachers who were part-time, you know, 0 0.6, 0 0.7, 0 0.8, we've increased their FTE to provide because of the needs we have now uh, based on the reopening and to serve the remote academy and the in-person hybrid students. All of our um, specialists, art, music, phys ed, um, are, and library are, are servicing students in both, um, both programs. Um, and so, and I mentioned the learning communities at Gibbs and Audison that we added um, and increasing the FTEs of the remote academy administrators. Um, we do have positions that have not been filled and we may not fill um, this, this year. And so we are still covering, um, we're covering some of, some of the costs by um, those vacancies. Um, and I think, um, that's that's it. I mean, this is definitely new that we're actually had to hire for all of the the schools we have in person this year, plus the remote academy, which really created some, as as people have mentioned, created new challenges and new staffing needs um, that we're trying to meet. Okay. So I, I can take questions. Great. So. Um, I'm looking for questions. I wasn't going to go in order unless it looks like most people do have questions. Okay. All right. Thank you, Mr. Spiegel. I get, I get off easier than everyone else. I don't, I guess it's late. The, uh, the slide deck is in um, Novus for people who are watching. Um, if they want to go back and review too. Okay, um, so the next item on the agenda um, that I put on because I was just hoping for an update was um, SAT options for AHS students. It sounds like um, we've had some challenges with finding uh, location for students to take the SAT in Arlington. I believe that has to do with uh, um, the larger spaces and the high school not being available um, and uh, challenges around getting the potentially using the Audison but if somebody could give an update on what options our students do have that would be great or do we not know at this point I don't, I don't think that we know right now. We can come back to you with that information at the next meeting. Um, uh, the issue is about large spaces and the issue was about the high school at the time. Um, so we will make a report next meeting. Great, that would be great. Thank you. Um, yeah. super, Mr. Thielman. Yeah, just one question on this. I, as a, how many students normally I know Dr. Janger is on the call, so he, uh, well, uh, how many students normally take the SAT at a time um, at the school? Do, 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 does anyone know? Nobody knows. You'd also have, you'd have, you'd have juniors and seniors and sometimes even sophomores taking it, so it could be a very right. no, number. Usually cap it, usually you sign up and then there's a limit and then it's capped. And so I just wonder what the cap is. I, don't, I just don't, because. Um, I think it's really more driven by the number of students. We get the, the, the um, proctors yeah. uh, based on that. We also have students come from other schools as well. Yeah, no, okay, because I, I mean, I'm hearing reports that we're getting the red gym fixed, we're getting things fixed, and it's, so there are spaces where things could take place. I just don't, I just don't. Well, I think, actually, we don't usually do the SATs in the red gym. Yeah. Um, they are spread out throughout the school with proctors, and um, I don't think we have the proctors, but we also weren't uh, committing any high school spaces uh, to SACs at this time. It's too late to register. It's too late to sign us up to, to be an SAT site at this point. It's already September 24th. Um, I don't know the answer to that, but yeah. I can find out. All right. I, I think it'd be good for us to find out. Thanks. Uh, Mr. Cardin? Yeah, so I mean, I, I think, you know, 
as we're talking about social and emotional learning uh, health of the community, one of, one of the stressors is this SAT issue. And I know that a lot of schools have gone test optional. A few have gone test blind, but taking this option away from kids is really pulling the rug out from under them. And so I, I do think we need to use our best efforts to, to get uh, this administered. Uh, they, we canceled September and October, but November and December are still available. Um, I, I think we just need to find a way to do it. And um, uh, I, I do hope that the administrative team, now that we're back in school, will, will devote some, some effort to that. Okay. Um, anybody else on this one? Okay. Um, superintendent search process update. Um, this is from Mr. Schliffman with a bullet of voting approval of membership of the superintendent search screening committee. Mr. Schliffman. Great. Thank you. The superintendent's uh, search process committee, uh, Dr. Allison Ampey, Mr. Card, and myself met on Monday. We went through 38 statements of interest from people who were looking to serve on the screening committee. Uh, these were extraordinary people. We had three senior people from DESE, um, for example. And one of the things you'd say is you don't want to have more DESE administrators on the panel than you do teachers. So you, you couldn't take all three. Uh, and we were looking to make sure that the people we were putting on were coming in with a different lens, this different viewpoint on the candidates, because there's no sense having a 15 member committee if we all see things the same way. Uh, we also had a commitment to the community that this committee would be diverse and we would do everything we can to get underrepresented communities uh, involved. So that in the 15 members that we are nominating and asking for a vote of approval for, two identified to us as African-American and three as Asian-American. Uh, a couple of people who were selected are, have identified as LGBTQ. We have immigrants, parents of special needs children and second language learners and immigrants. It is a diverse committee and there are gonna be 15 really good thoughtful viewpoints looking at the candidates coming through. And I'll just read to the categories that we filled and asking for your approval of this committee. Uh, the municipal official will be former school committee chair and current uh, member of the select board. He took a demotion. Joseph Curro. The three school committee members would be Dr. Allison Ampey, Mr. Cardin, and myself. The central office administrator would be Allison Elmer. The teachers would be Tom Machuk and Kim Pratt. The principals, the system principals, AEA uh, group would be uh, Mr. McEnany and Margaret Creedle Thomas. The parents are Inea Huang, uh, who's also the uh, CPAC chair. Jun Li Li, who's a high school parent, and Ramona Nichols Granucci, who's a Pierce parent. The wild card for other stakeholders are Karen Mollering, who's a Bishop parent, Kamal Bayesen, who is a Dallin parent and a Desi senior associate commissioner and Maya Patel Massini, who is a student. We are also, because of the nature of the work, recommending uh, two alternates to be elevated to full membership in the event of a vacancy uh, if one develops during the process. Uh, the alternates will be expected to attend the meetings, but will not have a vote unless they are elevated. And this is B. Quarteau, a student, and Sintu Mathi Revoluri, who is a uh, parent and a community member. Uh, so I move that the school committee approve the screening committee uh, for the first round of the superintendent search. Second. Discussion? Mr. Hainer. Uh, I assume you've already asked all these people are committed to meet, all, meet at all the times that you have uh, put together? Uh, yes, what we did was we stated that the uh, attendance would be based on, uh, membership would be based on a commitment to attend the opening session and we would plan out the, uh, the meetings from there. Uh, we haven't locked in the meetings in the future and we may have to work around town meeting. Hopefully we'll be done by then. 
but uh, we obviously can't meet on school committee nights or select board nights. So we'll, we'll work that out uh, along with the candidates, but the first orientation meeting night on, um, uh, it, it was in front of me a second ago, but next week uh, yeah. is, is a must. And if they don't make it to that meeting, they're off. Uh, yeah, the question and, and I have, mm -hmm. are all your meetings going to be open? No, these are executive session meetings. Thank you. Any other questions or comments before we vote on Mr. Schlickman's motion? All right, seeing none, uh, Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. Okay. Um, was that all you had, Mr. Schlickman? Uh, we're done. We're, we're going to go to work and uh, we'll report back when we have finalists. Great. And do you have plans to change the name of your, well, we'll, we'll get there when we get there, right? The this, this search process is wrapping up or no? No, no. We, we ha we'll have work to do in terms of coordinating the finals. Super. Okay. Uh, so we're, you know, but this is a, this is a screening committee, which is going to go and screen the uh, resumes and uh, interview the candidates. And the reason why it is done in executive session is that by doing it publicly would discourage most applicants who don't want to be exposed as the first round candidate. Uh, Mr. Hainer. Real quick, how many applicants are you planning on bringing forward? Three? Uh, depends on, on the pool. The discussion usually is around three to five. Okay. But if you, if, you, if you take a look at the results uh, of the screening, there's usually sort of a natural gap in the cut. And you're looking at, and, and if you've got four people you're really hung up on and, and, and think are really great, you're not going to arbitrarily whack one out of the finals. But if you only have three that you love, you'll only move three. Thank you. Any other comments, questions on this? Can I make a quick comment? You sure can. Um, I just wanted to say thank you to all the people who have followed. We had an amazing group. Um, we could have easily filled two or maybe even three category, three well-qualified committees from the um, applications that we had. It was pretty awesome. Great. Well, let's hold on to those names because I'm sure there's other things that we'll need people to do. Um, all right. Um, moving on. Consent agenda. All items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Vote approval of warrant, warrant number 21048, dated 9 15 2020, total amount 8830.81.74. Uh, vote approval of minutes, school committee September 10th, 2020 minutes. So move. Second. Okay. Uh, Ms. Dexton? Yes. Uh, Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am yes. Uh, policy second read, uh, KDAB temporary signs and banner BEDH and BEDH-E, public comment at school committee meetings, ACAB harassment, we have all, are these, oh, these are all the same ones underneath. Okay, uh, so we're on our second read, looking uh, from. Yes, uh, Madam <laughs> Chair, uh, yes, Madam Chair, ACAB was approved on the 10th, so we don't need to do that. All right, now. so let's pull that. So we're just looking at KDAB um, and BEDH and BEDH-E. Uh, I move adoption of policies KDAB, BEDH, and BEDH. H dash E. Second. Discussion? Seeing none. Ms. Exton? Yes. Mr. Cardin? Yes. Dr. Allison Ampey? Yes. Mr. Thielman? Yes. Mr. Schlickman? Yes. Mr. Hainer? Yes. And I am also yes. Subcommittee and liaison reports and announcements. Budget. Dr. Allison Ampey? Nothing to report. 
community relations, Mr. Hainer. I'm going to be setting up a meeting and uh, hopefully bringing forward to the next meeting. I'd like it on the agenda, school committee chat. Okay. Uh, CIAA, Mr. Carden. Uh, yes, I'll be scheduling a meeting. Um, I might want to do it as a standing meeting, maybe every week after the school committee weeks meets because we have um, a lot to go over with the various models and all that. And we also have to do the superintendent evaluation. Um, facilities, Mr. Thielman. Uh, we have not scheduled the next meeting. I walked around the facilities today with Mr. Feeney. They're making very good progress. Um, and I just try to get a sense of when he'll be ready for a report. I think we'll definitely have a meeting scheduled in early October and I'll look at schedules and set something up. Great. Uh, policy, Mr. Schlickman. Okay, we just cleared the policy agenda. So uh, any other trouble you'd like us to get into, uh, we're looking for work. Uh, uh, superintendent search process. And uh, we reported out in the meeting. Uh, high school building committee. No. No report we need. Uh, we have a meeting coming up in early October. Great. Liaison reports. Future agenda items. I have Mr. Hainer's um, school committee chats. Mr. Cardin. Uh, I think it would be useful to hear from the Medco director how things are going with Medco and the various models. Um, any others? On future agenda items, announcements, liaison reports, going once, going twice. All right, um, and we are not doing executive session, even though it's, yeah, we're not gonna do that. So that's great. Um, meeting, uh, we're gonna get in at 9.54, guys. Uh, uh, Motion to adjourn. Second. Press second. Second. Great, uh, Ms. Exton. Yes. Mr. Cardin. Yes. Dr. Al Snampy. Yes. Mr. Thielman. Yes. Mr. Schlickman. Yes. Mr. Hainer. Yes. And I am also, yes. Have a great night. Be safe. Thank you. Thank you, everybody. Thank you all for being here.